Sarah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm actually when we start because I I had oh. distracted with. Dean, you just remember we are we are um, live and people are in the meeting. So. Oh, okay. Forget it then. I'll I'm going to okay. text you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we we are indeed live on YouTube. Okay. All right. And have we moved our applicants in? Yes, the applicants are here. And yes. Okay. All right, great. Welcome back to the afternoon session of the Landmarks Preservation's uh, January 12th public hearing. We are beginning the afternoon with item number two, and I'll turn it over to Corey Harala to walk us through the afternoon session. Thanks, Sarah. And I am actually going to go ahead and read in a few items into the record that uh, we'll be presenting. Uh, <laughs> upcoming public hearing instead of this afternoon. We are keeping the last item number 10 on the agenda and we'll get to that. But uh, in advance of that, I'm going to read into the record items seven, eight, and nine. Uh, it's actually one presentation under the same ownership, but three separate items. And that's LPC 20-07838, 20-07839, and 20-07840, 76 through 80 West 82nd Street, also, uh, AKA 451 and 457 Columbus Avenue. Again, reading that into the record for today to be presented at a future uh, hearing date. And uh, with that, I'll move back to hearing item number two, LPC 21-01185, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1075, lot 14, 282 Garfield Place in the Park Slope Historic District. Uh, this is a row house built in 1910, and the application is to modify masonry openings and remove and relocate stained glass windows. And commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Please note that the staff will be presenting uh, this item and applicants are available for questions. Uh, staff, please introduce yourself and you may begin. Good afternoon, commissioners. Abby Hurlbut, preservation staff. This application is for work at the rear of the building at 282 Garfield Place, which is located on the south side of Garfield Place um, between 8th Avenue and Prospect Park West in the Park Slope Historic District. So there are, excuse me, three aspects to this proposal. The first is the combination of these windows here at the L to be enlarged to a larger um, metal and glass window assembly here. At staff level, we would be able to approve this if they were proposing a metal or masonry band at the first floor level to indicate a break in the space. However, the applicants are not proposing such bands, so this does require your review. Second aspect of this proposal is to remove this stained glass window here, um, sorry, and to reinstall it on a proposed rooftop penthouse that was approved at staff level, as you can see here, in order to accommodate the enlargement of these masonry openings. Finally, the third aspect is to enlarge these three window openings at the top floor. Um, please be advised that this stained glass window here, this sash is proposed to remain, but the uh, opening is proposed to be elongated. So now I'll take you through the, um, the rest of the presentation and give you some context uh, for the row. So here's the existing um, elevation and it's at the end of a, a row of three. As you can see, they have a pattern. So here's the proposed in context. Here's some plans. We can always come back to the plans if you'd like, but I'm gonna to skip to um, the elevation photographs. Here we are. So here's a close up of, of what we're talking about here. This is that stained glass window that is proposed to be installed at the proposed rooftop addition. And here's the stained glass sash that is proposed to remain, but the window is to be elongated here. Um, I will come back to this in a second, but I wanna give you some more um, context. So here's uh, what the front facades look like. You can see it sort of steps down towards um, 8th Avenue and you can sort of see the same thing here in the rear as it steps down towards 8th Avenue. Um, so that's the context for this proposal. Um, if you have any questions, uh, the architect Tom Winter is here to answer them. Thanks. Thank you, Abby. All right, do we have um, any questions for the applicant? Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. 
Just unmute your, yeah. accept yeah, my okay. request to unmute. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about the basement on, in your section. You show the window, it seems in grade level. Does this building have an English basement? Am I missing something? Um, uh, is, is, this, is the grade, is the window sitting on grade? No, so uh, yeah, we're proposing, one. oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Mr. Winter, can you just state your name for the record? Yeah, my name is Tom Winter. I'm the architect of 282 Garfield Place. So, um, yeah, so you see at the re elevation, uh, this larger <laughs> opening is actually um, in front of a double height space. Uh, so, uh, do I have control over this uh, presentation now? Can, can I switch back and forth? Okay, never mind. So, so we, have a floor, we have a floor plan which shows um, how the floors, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, if you can go to the first floor plan, please. There's one down, exactly there. Uh, so you see that um, it's annotated with the number three in red uh, at the top. Um, exactly, so that's that window opening and behind that window is a double height space. So we pull back that first floor uh, floor assembly to allow light into the basement. So this is a significant improvement uh, of the uh, visuals uh, of that basement. So it's not, it's right now it's a seven foot six uh, ceiling height. Uh, by pulling this back, it becomes a real usable room uh, with a connection, with a visual connection to the to this uh, backyard. Um, right. Yeah. So, so in, in in terms of, do you have a section that shows the level of the exterior with the with the building? Um, I'm just curious about the basement is aligned with the grade. Then is that what you're saying? Uh, no, the basement is uh, is a little bit below grade. You can see this from okay. the rear, from the rear elevation. Um, and you can, so the, um, the, the first floor is about five foot six above rear yard elevation, uh, subtracting a foot for the floor assembly. So it's four foot six, um, out of the ground. Exactly. There you can see it. It's about uh, four foot six out of the ground and about three feet into the ground. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. Got it. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, why don't we turn to public testimony and then Mr. Winter will come back to you after that. So um, if you're in the meeting and would like to uh, testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And we will, as always, begin with anyone who signed up in advance. And I'll turn it over to Lisa Savage to walk us through that. Okay, um, we had one person sign up. Um, that's George Calderaro. And George, I've already brought you in. Hello again, George Calderaro from the New York chapter of the Victorian Society in America. The Victorian Society supports this proposal as the work will not be visible from any public thoroughfare. Enlarging the window openings will require removing only a minimal amount of historic masonry. The design and proposed facade retains the character and scale of the row house and relocating these stained glass windows will pre preserve important historic facade elements. The Victorian Society also commends the architects for the decision to use asymmetrical double hung windows at the four window openings on the second and third floors with the height of the upper portion of the sash determined by the height of the existing stained glass panel on the third floor, noting that this will help unify this facade. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, thank you. And Rich, did we receive any written testimony? Yes, we do have a resolution from Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommending approval. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I think largely supportive, Mr. Winter. So I'm, I don't know if there's any final comment you'd like to make um, with respect to your, the appropriateness of your proposal. No, not Before really. So I think, uh, I think Abby uh, presented this very well and I don't have anything to add, thank you. Okay, all right. And commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, so I'm starting to uh, unmute or request to unmute all of you so that we can make a motion to close the hearing and begin our discussion. Okay, Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? I make a motion to close the hearing. Thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, so we're, we'll begin our discussion, and I think um, this is a proposal to alter the opening <coughs> at the, the uh, uh, rear yard addition, the L, and to modify other windows openings at the second and, <coughs> and third floors. Um, it also involves relocating one stained glass window and then just retaining another lengthening the opening. Um, and, you know, while uh, we often, in, when we are, have a row, we often see, uh, require that the openings at the top floor be maintained to read a, that continuous sense of the row. In this case, the row steps, and while the windows are changing slightly in their proportions, they are keeping the pattern. So that may be something that you all think about here, that it isn't, uh, they're not continuously in line and that there is still a discernible pattern. So that may be something that you all think about as you um, comment on this. So why don't we start our discussion and I'll start with Commissioner Holford-Smith. Sure, thank you. Um, I think this is um, appropriate and well thought out. Um, I'm looking at the original elevation of the rear and the three buildings that are similar, you know, they do steps so they're not exactly the same. They also, the window pattern kind of flips. So it's also not a regular pattern. Mm -hmm. And so I think the enlarging, the enlargement of the windows, but keeping the, uh, the arch, the shallow arch and keeping the, the three individual windows um, is appropriate. Um, and I think creating that double width opening onto the, onto the terrace and moving that stained glass window up to the penthouse is acceptable as well. And I think um, given the condition of the L with the basement level being sort of half above and half below grade, that putting a, a spandrel sort of in the middle would be kind of a false marking. And so I think that we, we could, I could approve the, the pretty much full height glass at the L. So I find this right, right, right. acceptable. Okay, and it and because it's not full width, I think it's a different kind of yeah, scale relationship. That quite a bit of brick on each side. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I can approve this as presented, and I agree with uh, what Commissioner Holford Smith just said as far as the rationale for the various areas. But I think this is fine as presented. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. I agree. It's okay as is. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I, I agree too. I think the pattern is disparate enough that uh, this can handle it. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree with all the commissioners as well. I like the pattern of stepping down. Uh, so there's a, a logic to this uh, design. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Commissioner Bland. Um, I'll agree as well with all the uh, uh, comments that have been made already, but I will state also this could be my house. This is uncanny. This is exact, all the details, everything is the same house. I wonder if it's the same architect. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it would improve my house too to do this. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Lutby. Um, I agree. I think uh, the changes are very appropriate. Okay, and Commissioner Jefferson. I can approve this. Commissioner Gustafson. Gee, Commissioner Bland, what if you go home and there's someone else living in your house? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been there in a while, so it's possible. <laughs> okay, uh, this is appropriate as is. Okay, and um, commission, and did, I don't know if that we heard from Commissioner Jefferson. Are you comfortable, yeah. Commissioner oh. Jefferson? Okay, great. Yes, yes. And then yes. Commission, all right, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I approve. This is appropriate. Okay, so we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make that motion? Thank yes. you. In the matter of LPC 21 01185, 282 Garfield Place in the Park Slope Historic District, a row house built in 1910. The application is to modify masonry openings and remove and relocate stained glass windows. I note that the building's scale. Materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Park Slope Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that the work will not be visible from, from a public thoroughfare, 
that the historic stained glass will be retained and relocated to the proposed penthouse, that the row of which this house is a part steps down and is somewhat irregular. Therefore, the work will not diminish the relationship of this house to others in the row, that the enlargement of the masonry openings at the top floor will be modest and will retain the arched lintels, a special feature characteristic of this facade and others in the row, and that the proposed two-story opening at the ground and first floors will be confined to the existing L and will feature masonry on all sides. Therefore, the scale of the opening will not overwhelm the building or diminish the residential character of the rear facade. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, and Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. Okay, that's approved. Thank you very much. And we'll move to the next item. Okay, the next item is number three, LPC 20 10086, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1143, lot 80, 97 St. Mark's Avenue in the Prospect Heights Historic District, an Italianate style row house with Second Empire style elements built circa 1869 to 1872. And the application is to install a bulkhead and mechanical equipment at the roof. Commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Um, please remember to unmute yourself, state your name for the record. You now have control of the presentation and you may begin. Hello, uh, this is Brian Ripple from Combined Architecture. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, and for some reason, my screen, uh, my view option, hold on, uh, start video. Okay. okay. Uh, the project's at 97 St. Mark's Avenue. Uh, it's in the Prospect Heights Historic District. Uh, the proposed scope of work is for a new bulkhead to the roof with accompanying roof terrace and to re relocate and add mechanical equipment to that roof area. Um, one point I'd like to make is that uh, following a presentation to the community board, we received some comments from them that we've incorporated in a revised uh, proposal, which is what we're presenting today. Um, I'll try and differentiate between what the original proposal was and the new one uh, that we're presenting today. And, um, okay. Sorry. Uh, so uh, this is the rooftop uh, bulkhead that we are proposing. The red line uh, that you're seeing, the red dashed line here and over here, represents the initial proposal uh, that we had presented uh, before the community board. They come back to us with four comments. One was they asked us to reduce uh, the mass of the bulkhead uh, and thus reduce visibility specifically, um, visibility from uh, St. Mark's Avenue. Uh, they asked us to not stack mechanical equipment such that we could further reduce the bulk of that, of that bulkhead. Originally, the mechanical equipment was stacked on the back of it with screening. Uh, thirdly, they asked us to uh, uh, modify our railing, which was intended to be glass, uh, uh, they had thought the glass might be reflective and, and more noticeable. So to do something, uh, it said metal or cable rail. And uh, the last was they asked us to modify the color and we'll present that in a moment. We've tried to comply with all of their comments uh, and we feel like we've come up with a proposal that's done so. Um, so just to understand the extent of the roof terrace, roof terrace is this area here. There's a fairly significant slope. So it's set on two different levels. Uh, such that we can have a level walking surface without uh, the mass at the rear of the building being too large. And again, the mechanical equipment that was discussed has been relocated over to this area, no longer stacked one on top of the other to reduce its profile. Uh, this is the uh, kind of zoom in on the front and the rear elevation. The, the red dashed line, the orange, represents the initial proposal that we've again reduced by, uh, by pushing the bulkhead towards the back and then uh, coming up with a tighter roof structural system so that it's a, the overall assembly would be less. Uh, again, the orange is showing original and then the modified. So we were able to, by, by pushing it back, we were able to um, uh, en enter the deck at a lower level on this slope and thereby uh, uh, 
it, that plus reducing the depth of the structure enabled us to get about 18 inches worth of, of reduction in that point. At the critical kind of threshold here, the reduction was over three feet. Uh, this is just showing a section where, in essence, we, we brought it down to the absolute minimum, which is a seven foot uh, headroom landing at that roof area, which is again, hitting the roof at its slope. Uh, this is a, a 3D, again, showing original and modified. Um, so here, we, we originally were proposing just sort of a dark bronze color. Uh, there was discussion that perhaps it would be uh, less visible uh, if we were to uh, draw on some of the color from the existing mansard roof, which is what we're now proposing. So it's a light gray color, uh, which is going to match uh, the, the, the paint, which is on the mansard roof at the front of the building. Um, the other material is just a, a porcelain paper on the surface, which is not visible. So um, you can see those are the two tiers uh, such that we can level it out without increasing uh, the, 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 the mass and the visibility on the back. Uh, these are the mechanical units you're seeing right there. Uh, this is the mock-up. Uh, again, just to be clear, the, the red was the initial one. We went and modified it and did that in blue uh, to differentiate. So you can see the original proposal versus the modified. Um, for the sake of clarity, we left the structure of the original one so that from the street views, one is able to understand the original mass versus the proposed, but we didn't want it to be too confusing. So we removed the mesh on that and left the blue mesh for the proposed. Uh, this is a view looking in the other direction, um, which the mechanical equipment would be located over here. Um, so uh, there was concern about the degree of visibility. And when we initially erected the mock-up, it was in late summer. Um, we went back and re-photographed, uh, and because now with the trees no longer in, in bloom, uh, there's, there was more visibility than we had even been aware of, uh, but the, the, the reduction that we made has made that significantly less. Um, what you're seeing here is primarily the structure of the original proposal. As we zoom in uh, a little bit further along, you'll be able to see, again, slightly through the trees, uh, it's, it has a degree of visibility there. Um, as uh, from the actual, uh, the north side of St. Mark's Avenue, there's no visibility along the full extent of the block. So it's only from the opposing side. So at this point uh, where you can see where we're across the street on a slight angle, uh, the structure you're seeing is the original. There's a small portion of the blue mesh you're seeing there. So there is a, a small degree of visibility of, at this point, as well as I believe the next point, uh, very, oh, no, this point actually has no, no longer has any visibility. Um, with the proposed uh, modification. Uh, this is the gray material that we're matching the color for. Uh, no visibility once we, we, we head uh, east on the street. Um, on Carlton Avenue, there's two vacant lots on Carlton. Um, the first vacant lot has no visibility. Uh, the second, um, in winter especially, uh, you are able to see this portion of it, uh, again, seeing in blue. The, the modified and then the framework was the original proposal. Uh, and then it, it gets eclipsed almost immediately. And then on the rear uh, street of Bergen, uh, we didn't think there was any visibility when the, with the trees now uh, no longer in bloom. You can see the tree line here. Uh, this portion of the bulkhead is visible from across the street on Bergen. Uh, and then moving along, no longer visible. And uh, that's the full presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions, commissioners? Okay, not seeing any questions. And we'll see if we have anyone here to speak. If you'd like to speak on this item, please raise your hand, your virtual hand, so we can identify you. And um, I'll turn it over to Lisa to walk us through the testimony. Lisa? Okay, thank you. We had two people sign up. I'm gonna start with Mary um, Shepherd. And Mary, I've brought you in as a panelist. You just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. And Mary, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Okay. All right. I'm trying to get the camera on. Oh, there, there we go. We Great. Okay. Um, Prospect Heights Neighborhood Association is very happy to be able to present our comments on the Certificate of Appropriateness for 97 St. Mark's Avenue. 
Uh, the application is the state is to construct a new stair bulkhead and roof terrace mechanical equipment to be located at roof adjacent to the new bulkhead and a rail surrounding the terrace. Following comments made by Mr. Bacconi on behalf of PHNDC at the general meeting of Brooklyn Community Board 8, the applicants, as was stated, revised their plans to reduce the size of the bulkhead and paint it gray, change the configuration of the condenser units so that they are not stacked in a mechanical closet behind the bulkhead and substitute a black painted rail for the glass rail originally proposed. We very much appreciate the applicant's consideration. The revised mock-up shows the bulkhead would barely be visible from St. Mark's Avenue within the Prospect Heights Historic District. As such, and given the applicant's willingness to devise, revise their plans in response to our prior comments, we have no objection to the application. Great, thank you. And could you please just state your name for the record? Mary Shuford. I'm with uh, PADC. Okay, thank you very much. And I don't see the other person that signed up and I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. And testimony. Rich, thank you. Rich, do we have any written testimony? We do have the uh, previously mentioned uh, community board resolution from community board eight. Uh, they recommended approval uh, with several conditions, including reducing the size of the bulkhead, uh, consideration of a different type of color, not stacking the condensers uh, and changing the color of the railing. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Ripple, I, it seems that you have addressed the community board's um, concerns already up front in your presentation and otherwise their supportive testimony. Is there any final comment you'd like to make before we move to our discussion? No further comments. Okay, and commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, so I am going to start unmuting or requesting to unmute you so that we can make a motion to close the hearing. And um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, and as has been stated, this is for a stair bulkhead. Um, and when it was originally calendared, it was uh, much more visible in many respects. And at this point, the visibility has been reduced in response to the community board's uh, process. Um, so that really from one point, do you just see a little corner over the front facade at a slightly oblique angle? And other views are, you know, I think the bulkhead is really disassociated from the building itself. And so um, this seems to be in the realm of pretty minimally visible and not detracting from the building or the district. Um, does anyone have any other particular thoughts on this one? Okay, does anyone disagree or think that there sh should be changes to any aspect of it? Okay, I sort of rushed through that one just because I know we have a long agenda to catch up on. Okay, so um, if if uh, you agree, how about um, Commissioner Luxy? Would you? Oh no, actually, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make this motion? Sure. Thank you. In the matter of LPC. 210086 97 St. Mark's Avenue, Prospect Heights Historic District, an Italianate style row house with second empire style elements built in circa 1869 to 1872. The application is to install bulkhead and mechanical equipment at the roof. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Prospect Heights Historic District. And I recommend approval finding that none of the work will damage or destroy any significant architectural features, that the simple massing and metal cladding of the bulkhead will be in keeping with utilitarian bulkheads found at the buildings of this type, scale, and age, that the bulkhead will only be minimally visible in the context of the front facade from the, from the west on St. Mark's Avenue and from drops in the street wall on Bergen Street and Carlton Avenue, where it will be minimally visible over secondary facades from limited vantage points at a distance and will not call undue attention to itself and that the work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the building or the historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I so second. Thank you. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? 
Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, that's approved. Thank you very much. And we'll move to the next item. Thanks, Sarah. And we are actually trying to track down the next applicant. I'm going to see if we can switch items, but I may, may need uh, just a minute to figure that out. Let me just pause okay. for a second. <clears throat> Okay, I think we are going to jump around just a bit and move to item number five, LPC 21-03888, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1893, lot 35, 375 Riverside Drive in the Morningside Heights Historic District, District, a Renaissance Revival style apartment building designed by Gaetan Aiello and built in 1921 to 22. The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of windows. Uh, commissioners, um, the applicant for this item has joined the hearing. Um, please remember to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. And you now have control of the presentation, which you can advance using mouse or the arrow keys. You may begin. Uh, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for your time. My name is Michelle Dahlhoff, and I am presenting on behalf of 375 Riverside Drive. Um, this proposal is for to establish a, a window master plan for 375 Riverside Drive. The goals of this master plan are to provide a unified building appearance and re-establish fenestration pr proportions that has been lost over time while paying homage to the building's historic detailing and provide modern service needs while maintaining the historic operation. The building-wide standards proposed as part of this master plan would provide brick-to-brick -brick replacement windows with aluminum frames and double-hung operation and restoration of paired window and mullion proportions throughout. Three Seventy Five Riverside Drive is located on the southern side of the Morningside Heights Historic District, which was established in February of 2017, highlighted here for clarity. Uh, the subject building, um, although it has a very uh, subtle muted color palette, um, is very much intact um, and has beautiful um, brick corbeling details and um, most of the uh, original uh, limestone and terracotta details are also intact. Here are the existing conditions. On the left-hand side, you can see the 110th Street, also known as Cathedral Parkway. And on the right-hand side is the Riverside Drive. These are the two primary facades. The rest of the facades are at the south and at Courtyard and, um, and, the, west, and at the east at um, uh, um, adjacent lot line. In the 1940s tax photo, you can see that the original configurations were six over one with um, very subtle mutton detailing. By the 1980s, you can see that the majority of those original configurations had already been lost. So by 
out of the 100 year lifespan of this building um, in the last 40, possibly closer to 50 years, the majority of the operations have been one over one. The existing conditions vary throughout um, with different panning details, different depths of um, jam and, and head configurations and sills. And the proposal would try to eliminate some of these irregularities throughout the facade. In addition to those irregularities in the installed detailing, there are some locations where single light casement units have been installed. At the off street facades, the primary facade detailing um, disappears and the majority of the operations are also one over one. Here are some more general existing condition photos of the courtyard. None of these facades are visible from the primary streets. It's important to note that the neighboring property at 370 Riverside Drive, um, on the, in the right photo, you can actually see both uh, 375 and 370, had a prior master plan approved uh, that also um, established one over one as the standard from a prior divided light configuration. Here are elevations showing the new proposed one over one configurations throughout. And again, at the off streets. Um, it's, although the majority of the window configurations existing are single punched windows, there are um, paired window configurations. One line of paired window configurations at the Riverside Drive, so the only paired configuration um, at the primary facades, which you can see on the right, um, which it irregularly switches um, pairings along the, the length with a slimmer window and a wider window configuration. As part of this proposal, we are re-establishing a consistent um, mullion width and reintroducing some mullion detailing. At the off street on the left, the pairings are evenly proportioned. Here on the left, you can see an interior image of one of these um, paired window configurations at Riverside Drive with the very narrow window and the larger window. These are additional details of some of the existing conditions, um, very large panning details covering existing jam conditions where at other areas such as on the left where the historic mullion between the two windows has been lost. There was one area where we were able to observe some historic brick molding details where there was a very subtle uh, beaded profile. Here are elevations showing both the uh, historic existing and the newly proposed window configurations. These are the singles and then the paired configurations. This is a planned section showing the paired configurations and how the mullion width will be reintroduced. Section details also showing uh, new panning at the window head, um, which in subsequent slides, I will show the um, reintroduction uh, of some detailing. Here, although I'm sorry, a little small for the slide, you sh I show the um, representative historic brick mold detail that we were able to locate. And on the right, number two, uh, the reintroduction of that, uh, that subtle beading detail at the panning for the window um, jams uh, head and the mullion configurations at those isolated areas of paired windows. Um, the most, the majority of the existing windows are black, but based on our research um, photos and some representative locations, we, um, we have 
proposed a medium bronze, which we think is more appropriate to the facade and its buff and more natural color. Uh, so in closing, um, the, although the original had a divided light configuration, um, the existing double hung uh, one over one has been in place for over 40 years. Um, we would like to reintroduce the proportions, the panning details throughout, and this is consistent with the neighborhood and a similar master plan for the adjacent property. All right, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? All right, not seeing any questions. I think we'll move straight to public testimony and we may have questions after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And we'll, as always, start with anyone who signed up in advance. And so I'll turn it to Lisa Savage to walk us through the testimony. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'll start with Sean Corsandi. And Sean, I've brought you in. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee reviewed this proposal carefully. And we thank the owners for their foresight in preparing the future of the building they steward. 375 Riverside Drive came late in Gatana Lejo's architectural career. Completed in 1922, it featured many of the hallmarks of good urban living that he commonly employed at the time, namely elevators not visible upon first entry, lighter color brick, and multi-light over one windows. Within four years, he would abruptly cease his career in architecture, return to his native Italy, and spend his days as an inventor. His inventiveness even led him to reinvent himself once more as a painter upon his 1930 return to New York. But among his many creations in his century long life was never the reinvention of his own windows. This landmark holds physical evidence of the profiles of the original multi-light windows and photographs fill in the rest. The proposal before you does not match appearance nor material. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee recommends modifications to this application to consider the original multi-light model. There is no need to permanently codify a full reinvention of these windows for the worse. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, uh, Michelle Parker. Uh, Michelle, I've brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself, turn on your camera. Thank you. Oh, it's really hard to follow up uh, with Sean. My name is Michelle Parker. I'm co-chair of the Preservation Com uh, Committee at uh, Community Board 7, and our community board uh, unanimously approved this application because we found the unification of the facade, the restoration of the brick mold details, the color material and configuration of the proposed master plan to be appropriate to the character of the historic district. And we appreciate, uh, maybe it's by coincidence or maybe by plan, that uh, their plan will also be unified with that of the building next door to them at 370 Riverside Drive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. And finally, Kelly Carroll. Kelly, there you go. Thank you, Lisa. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. In Gaetan Aiello's portfolio, this building is among the more restrained ones in design. The absence of the architect's usual employment of elaborate ornament makes the case for restoring the divided light conf window configurations as they add a layer of detail to an otherwise flat facade. Since the multi-panes multi were solely on the upper sash, it is nearly a compromise, and we hope that the master plan will adopt and restore this original design intention. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And with that, I uh, believe that's the end of the testimony. Okay, and Rich, did we receive any other written testimony? No other written testimony. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'd like to turn back to the applicant and see if you'd like to make any final comments or, or respond to the testimony. 
Yes, I will say that even though the designation does note that the facade is very restrained, uh, I would argue that there is a certain richness and intactness to the details. Um, I th I've heard some prior arguments that the adjacent building is more elaborate, but I think that there is a lot of character and um, lushness to the facade. Um, currently. I think additionally adopting a divided light over single light, um, we all know would create a patchwork appearance likely for many, many decades to come. And I think that continuing the one over one configuration is more likely to restore the, the balance of the facade and um, keep it as it has been for almost half of its lifespan. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any final questions? Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead and just uh, accept my request on mute. Yes, uh, I'm a bit confused. The upper level have multi-light windows, say the top level, or could you go back to the section, to the elevation and show me what the original configuration was? I don't seem still, to be able to yeah. advance the slides. You still have control of the presentation. You can try using the arrow keys and go up. Oh, you go. Thank you. Um, the, the windows were historically uh, six over one with uh, some isolated four over one, but here you can see. The, 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 what the whole building, not a portion of the building, right? Oh, of course. Oh, okay, okay. Which, uh, yeah, Commissioner Jefferson, I think if your question was, was it the whole building that had that configuration? The answer is yes, they all had the multi-light sash. Oh, okay. Sash okay. And the light in the lower sash on all of the floors. All of them. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I am now um, unmuting or requesting to unmute you. Uh, so that we can close the hearing and move to our discussion. So if, uh, if I have to request it, please make sure that you accept that request. Okay. And um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. All right. And Commissioner Luffy, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll begin our discussion now. And so commissioners, we've, you know, we've had, uh, I've given you the history of the commission's approach to windows. You, many of you have now become part of that historic evolution and discussion. And, you know, while the commission historically approved master plans for one over one um, with improved panning and finishes, in the hopes of achieving a good uniform window in lieu of the historic configuration, the commission has um, evolved. And at this point, we um, have often approved one over one as we did on the neighboring building and we have other times not. And lots of times the, the discussion is split, but the sort of the standard that we have come to is sort of whether or not the building's style, its presence and its level of ornament <laughs> on its own speaks to its style um, and whether or not those window, that window configuration is critical to the style. Um, I think we've also in other presentations seen how even buildings of this age and type have were sometimes historically built with one over one windows. So we know that the window was being used at the time, um, but certainly um, you know, the applications that we're looking at, we're always being asked to consider replacing some multi-light configuration with a one over one. And as I said, our decisions have been mixed. So um, we'll begin this discussion. And I think just also to make sure that we cover everything in our comments, this is not just for the primary facades, but for courtyard facades as well. So just let's cover all aspects of it in our comments. So, um, here we go again. Commissioner Bland, would you like to start this one? <laughs> um, uh, I guess you can still see me. Can you see me? Something's going on. Yes. Um, we can hear you. For, yes, we can see you. 
Okay, uh, sorry, uh, my Zoom is now taken over somehow. Um, yeah, I have no problem with this. Um, uh, I understand that this is a different configuration, but it seems to me as if the one over ones are, are fine. They, uh, it, 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 a lot of them have been one over ones for probably more than half of the history of the building any, anyway. And I think uh, <laughs> consistency, at least in my judgment at this point, outweighs uh, uh, some going back to the original. So I'm fine with this. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi? Uh, I happen to agree uh, <clears throat> with what Fred says. I also want to say I appreciate the fact that the building is, uh, you know, reintroducing the proper window proportions. They're putting in the metal panning, and also they're doing a brick-to-brick -brick installation, which is, you know, not all done and is actually more costly. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, this is a, uh, a beautiful, complicated facade, and it's, it's, I'm looking at it and seeing all the rhythms it has. I think the windows one over one will be fine. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson? Well, it was only a matter of time before you got one of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> with, 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 all, with all due respect to Brother Gaetan, um, I don't think the present style and level of ornament on the building um, um, sufficient, sufficient to justify the one over ones. Um, as I've said before, uh, this is really a matter of forever right or forever wrong. I hear the arguments about in, the inconsistency over a short period of time, and I think uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, the bottom line is that we are we we are asked to tolerate you know a few decades of inconsistency um, so that. Um, unless we expect the building to collapse after 30 years, um, the rest of time it's going to be um, consistent. It's not going to be inconsistent forever um, uh, because these windows are not going to last forever. Um, so with regard to the street facades only, um, I, would, um, I would ask for the six over ones. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Shamir Barron. Hi, hi, hi. Um, so Strangely, I, I'm trying to figure out why I think that one over ones could work here. Um, and I think it has something to do with the, the proportion of each of the windows. They're very, um, they, they have a very kind of solid proportion and, and it works well, I think, with the one over one. But I think that as a form of compromise and the maintaining some vestige of, of the historic, I think I agree with Commissioner Gustafson about um, the, the, the bottom floors um, having six over one and then the others one over one. I don't think that's uh, Is that what he said? No, no. he said that the second he said, but uh, that's okay. Oh, then maybe explain to me what, what was, I thought it was that the, the I, bottom I, podium. John was fine with the there. secondary facades being one over one, oh, but I not the street understood. facades. I misunderstood. Well, huh? Then I'm uh -oh. I'm offering something else, aren't I? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I think I might stick with that then. <laughs> okay. But it's just like when we sat next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that you your a compromise you would propose is the multi light over one in the base. Yes, in the base. Correct. Okay. All right. Great. Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, I agree with Commissioner Gustafson on this one. I think that the facade is relatively um, unadorned. And I think that the six over one is really something that would bring a lot more detail to the facade. And I think it should be instituted on the, on the street facing facades only. Okay. And Commissioner Chapin? Uh, I, I actually also agree with Commissioner Gustafson and Commissioner Holford Smith uh, on this one. I feel that while it's, it is an elegant building, uh, it is not very adorned. And I feel that this is a kind of important feature of this building for the primary facades. And the example the applicant chose to compare it to 370 is I, really much more ornate than, than, this, uh, than this building. 
you know, it's always it's always a difficult call, but I I, I feel that the, in this case uh, that we should have the multi light on the primary facades. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, I'm I'm with John John Gustafson. I think that Gustafson. I think that this is a uh, building that epitomizes the unadorned spectrum. <clears throat> I think all you have to do is look across 110th Street to the north, and you'll see a an abundantly adorned building. <clears throat> I forget the name of it, but it's it's an amazing uh, castle. <clears throat> um, and down the block on 110th Street on the north side, there are a few other remarkably uh, over adorned buildings. This is not one of them. I know the building pretty well. It is the epitome of unadorned, and it, it, it you know, uh, we should be sticking with uh, Gaetan's original uh, vision for it. Uh, and uh, uh, short-term consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. So, there's mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Commissioner Kevin, sure. <laughs> Yikes. Um, I would never second guess Gaetan's original design. I, I go with John and uh, the other rebels and I think that it should be multi-light over one on the principal facades. And I'm, you know, the argument of the patchwork argument is so tired at this point. Um, I, I just cringe whenever I hear that because what we will be doing is moving the building back to the proper and appropriate design. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen. Well, the benefit of going last is obviously that uh, the majority has decided. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, 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 you know, I was looking at this and thinking that, you know, our practice has been, you know, the traditional uh, allowing, given the massive scale is the 101 for half a century, but somehow in this case, the testimonial uh, from Landmark West um, somehow intrigued me about the rareness of this detail. So I think in this case, I agree with the majority. Okay, all right. So um, I think what we have are uh, Aaron, enough votes to- uh, Aaron, yes. can I, can I um, just say something? Um, yes. Uh, uh, the, the minority, I mean, there's the rebel. So I, um, I do want to say that I, if the majority is going to vote for six over one, I don't think it makes sense to only do six over one on the main facade. I mean, why wouldn't it be, be what the uniform, if the uniform condition was six over one and that's what the majority feels we should do, then the whole building should be six over one. I agree. Because then what we uh, have well, well, one thing I would say is this is approach that the commission has approved a number of times in the past because the secondary facades have a usually in those cases where we've approved it a, um, a, a more common brick and it's a less ornamented uh, more sort of utilitarian facade, so less designed facade, I should say. And so there is usually a return of masonry and then the change um, in the entire style of the building. And so that's been the reason the commission has found a simpler window to be but, appropriate on those less designed facades. And Corey, perhaps we could look at some photos to see how you see these secondary facades as commissioners think about this. Okay, I'll uh, ask Edith to try to flip to mm -hmm. see if in any particular slides show it, but I do believe the gap on Riverside between this building and 370 is relatively narrow, uh, meaning you'd see the windows between obliquely at best, other than perhaps the first uh, bay of them. And I don't believe you see any of the others, except for perhaps over shorter buildings to the other direction, which would certainly be a secondary view. Uh, so really, you know, in terms of how staff would review this, you know, if for any facades that aren't visible at all, any configuration could be used. Um, and for ones that are minimally visible, even there, there may be some flexibility. So I think in this case, that gap is what you're seeing in that center photo uh, up on the slide now. It may be really the only prominent view of uh, the windows on secondary facades here. Oh, what was there originally? I'm not sure that we know that because it's the type of angled view that, that doesn't show well in the tax photos or really any historic photos. It would be 
kind of a chance encounter to, to get that type of image uh, from a historic photo. Okay. Okay, so I think we did have six who would support um, the approval to replace the windows uh, with the condition that the street facades we return to the six over one con configuration. And um, so I think unless others have also reconsidered that, I think that's where we are. So why don't we take that motion and see how we turn out with the vote. So Commissioner Gustafson, would you make that motion? Sure. In the matter of LPC 21-03888, 375 Riverside Drive in the Morningside Heights Historic District. The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of windows. I note that the building scale, style, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Morningside Heights Historic District. Um, I also note that almost all the windows were replaced prior to designation. Um, I recommend uh, um, um, approval with a modification. That establishment that of a master plan will provide for the maintenance of uniform fenestration over time. Uh, that the historic windows were not present at the time of the designation of the historic district. Therefore, no significant architectural features of the building will be lost or repaired that, or replaced. That the proposed metal windows will be in keeping with the historic wood windows in terms of operation details and finish. That the proposed profile metal panning will replicate the historic wood brick molds in terms of basic profiles and design. However, um, I find that the one over one configuration is not in keeping with the historic window configurations typically found at Renaissance Revival style buildings of this type and age, which included multi-light configurations, either at both the upper and lower sashes or at just the upper sashes. And that multi-light upper sashes were a significant feature of the original design of this building street facades, which include large expanses of simply designed brick brickwork. Therefore, um, I recommend that the replacement windows at the primary facades, the street facing facades, feature multi-light upper sashes to match the historic configuration. Okay, hey, thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. Okay, and Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, so that's approved with that modification and we'll move to the next item. Okay, and we're actually going to uh, skip back to the one that we had just uh, skipped over, uh, we have the applicant now. So that's item number four. Uh, LPC 21-03900, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 175, lot 7504, 271 Church Street in the Tribeca East Historic District. This is an Art Deco style office building designed by Cross and Cross and built in 1930. The application is to modify a masonry opening, <coughs> landfill, and install signage. And commissioners, the applicant has joined the hearing. Um, please remember to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you may begin. Please remember to unmute yourself. I think you're still muted. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes, we can hear you. All right, great, thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Todd Zwigard. I'm the architect for the project located at 271 Church Street, also known, known as 90 Franklin, the 17-story Art Deco Tower on the corner of Church Street and Franklin Street. The scope of the work for our project is the removal of a window on Franklin Street in order to create a new entrance to one of the tenant spaces, a, a retail store, um, and the uh, uh, adding a, a new pin-mounted sign above the opening 
and some minor modifications to the sidewalk to make the new entrance work. We are located in the Tribeca East Historic District. You can see our location there in the district and here at the corner of Church and Franklin. We've outlined in red the bay, which we are proposing for the new entrance um, to a retail store in the photograph shown here. Here are the historic photos of the building. You can see the Art Deco character. You can see the symmetrical design of both the church and the Franklin Street facades. And we are at the center point of this facade here in that photo. Here are um, three contemporary photographs showing the full width of the Franklin Street facade, the bay proposed for the new entrance at the center, uh, a closer view of that and a frontal view. You can see the existing granite base which runs along the bottom. You can see the limestone panels on the sides and the uh, decorative brickwork denoting the center bay uh, only. It does not exist on any other bays except for the middle of this facade. So our client has inherited a very difficult and untenable situation in which all three of his tenants here shown A, B, and C all enter from a single door on Church Street. It creates crowding, it creates congestion, and it is not working. Um, also, tenant C, which is the, um, the one we're talking about, has no street frontage, so it's very difficult for retail. Our proposal is to take this bay and create a new entrance, alleviating congestion here and giving tenant C uh, some street presence. I'm showing this uh, slide um, because I'm comparing the Church Street entrance with the proposed Franklin Street entrance. One of the main reasons that we feel that this proposal is appropriate is that the, uh, this, only this window bay on Franklin has the uh, blank wall panels on either side of it and the decorative brickwork above. Uh, for some reason, I've lost the view of my cursor, so I might not be able to continue pointing. Um, and it makes this bay unique on this facade and different than the other windows. So it really appears to be a natural place to create a door. And uh, that is, that's what we're uh, proposing to do. It is a simpler version. Obviously church is more ornate, uh, but it is very similar and sets that up as an entrance quite nicely. Here is a, uh, here are the, uh, or the, Elevational drawings showing Church Street existing, Church Street proposed, no change there except for minor view of the pin mounted side on that sign on that side. You can see already previously approved um, pin mounted. Well, I should clarify, these are rail mounted uh, signs. That's what we're proposing. The rail mounts to the facade and the letters mount to the rail. Here is the uh, Church Street, Franklin Street facade, and you can see the existing condition, uh, the ornamental bronze panels above, which we are, of course, proposing to remain. That's a significant part of the historic character. Um, you can see the blank panels on the sides and the decorative brickwork above. Here we are proposing, well, let me advance uh, to a larger blow up of this to describe the design proposal. Here's the existing, here's the proposed. So in order to be able to enter, we would propose to remove the granite base below this bay carefully because we would reuse those stones to create the side returns that would start from the original joint and be chamfered on the top and mitered at the corner to return back to the facade. Um, the ornamental panels would be cut just below and we would be um, adding in a, a, a panel, a, um, a matching panel, which would allow us to set the proposed storefront back 10 inches from the existing line because the new entrance store is required to swing out by code 
and also by code, that door cannot swing more than 18 inches onto the sidewalk. So that is one fairly uh, large change from the existing, which is, is all a flat plane. We would be pushing this portion back 10 inches in order to meet the code. Something kind of nice that happens while doing that though, is it tends to mitigate the difference between the, uh, the misalignment of the new mullions with the old frames in the ornamental panels. And you'll see that in the rendering, the uh, 36 inch wide is, uh, width of the door is also a code requirement. So we would not be able to align here, but as you'll see in, in orthogonal oblique views, that is very diminished and hard to actually notice. I'll also take you through the mullion sections and you can see that the new proposed storefront system by Cornier, which is an aluminum system with a uh, black anodized finish is an excellent match to the bronze and the dimension of the profile inch and three quarter captures the scale of the windows, although not exactly the same because these were operable units. Um, they no longer function, but they were originally operable, um, but still the scale, um, the lightness of the facade uh, of the system is quite similar. Um, those are the main features of the design and the proposal. Uh, here in the section, you can see the setback I'm referring to. This is the existing, and then here is the new, with the single center door. And then once you come inside, we could be creating a landing and steps down. Uh, we do not need to have a handicap ramp because we have handicap accessible entrance to this store from a, a, the, a different entrance, a, a side entrance. Um, here you can see the comparison of, of the mullion dimensions, inch and three quarter existing, inch and three quarter proposed, that would be exact. Here in a typical horizontal, uh, we have, um, I believe that is inch and five eighths. I can't read my own dimensions. Yes, inch and five eighths. And in ours is inch and three quarters, so slightly larger, but very close. The door head detail, of course, is different because there was no door in the, uh, in the um, horizontal sections at the side, we had existing two and um, five eighths, I'm sorry, two and three eighths. And we're proposing two and five eighths. So, so slightly larger, but uh, very close. Um, inch and a half here, existing to inch and three quarter here but the overall four and a half because of the operable sashes is wider and our door section actually matches exactly that width. So we, we, we feel we're very consistent with those proportions. The pin mount is the sign above the, of the door um, is similar to the previously approved signs on the building. We felt it was a good idea to be consistent with one um, style of signage on the building. And uh, here we would have the rail, the channel rail, which would be powder coated to match the uh, color of the stone. And then the aluminum letters would be painted black, taking the name of whatever tenant the, uh, we would, we would uh, end up signing with, the owner would sign with. And here you can see uh, one view showing the sign, showing the new facade showing the 10 inch setback. And you can see how from this view, you really can't tell that these mullions don't align with those, uh, with the vertical and the frames of the ornamental molding. Uh, the, the sidewalk slopes, so within that setback zone, we could um, go from slope to level with a, a subtly warped plane in concrete, which does, uh, which is subtle enough and does meet ADA requirements. Um, Here is a photograph of the sample held up. You can see that it's an excellent um, com comparison and in different light levels, you can see that it really behaves, that anodize, it's a, it's a matte anodizing that tends to behave in light, very, very similar to bronze. It's unlike flat paint. So we think that's an excellent match um, and that's the proposed material. And finally, here is a rendering showing a frontal view with the sign with the new storefront. 
with the return base and the ornamental panels above. In summary, we feel that this is an excellent design, uh, very appropriate because of its location on the building and uh, solves a, a difficult problem for our client in a, in a nice way. Uh, I'm complete with my presentation. And at this point, I'll take any questions if there are any. Okay, thank you. We do have some questions. Commissioner Holford Smith, please go ahead. Yes, my question was about the return of the stone, um, the, the limestone. You're, you're proposing to add a return to the granite base, but you're yes. pushing the, the line of the, the, new, the new door and basically storefront. You're pushing that further back. So do you know right. if there's stone? to cover that depth or will you have to add stone to that? No, the stone goes through. We will have some uh, holes to be filled and blended with the stone, but the stone does uh, return into the opening. Okay, great. All right, great, thanks. Next we'll have Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, uh, thank you. Does, uh, in reference to page 15, um, yeah. does the, all right, we're on it, does the, inside face of the door frame <clears throat> align with the upper, um, you know, divided in three ornamental panel, the inside line. Right now I'm seeing, I, I can't tell if there is any alignment of any kind. So uh, I mean by inside face, yeah. So the alignment, um, I was, I'm trying to point and can't see my cursor again, but um, can I go back? So the alignment. You, um, I really wish I could point. The, the horizontal mullions at the top of the door are all in alignment. Here we go. So the, this line right here, I just lost it again. The horizontal mullions at, at the top of the door take their height from the existing window. And then the uh, door is set just below the middle one as it needs to be in that opening. So I- That's not what I'm asking. Let me okay. try again. Let me try again. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, the, the frame, the door frame, the new door frame that you're proposing? Yes. It's. It's, it had its interior line, this one. Um, is aligns with, oh. does it align with that? It looks like not, right? No, it, no, it does not. And, and I'm wondering if you've considered ways to have uh, some kind of other alignments made maybe with a thicker door frame or something. I'm just curious if you've made any efforts in, in trying to achieve this alignment, even though you can't make the opening smaller. Well, um, we, we felt that it we were trying to keep the overall effect of this as, as simple as possible, simple lines um, and, and not, you know, um, Okay. Not purely a recreation, but but uh, of what was there, but uh, something that has integrity to itself, and that would be just straight, simple lines. That was our thought. I'm talking about alignments, not about simplicity. But okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Oh. Um, two questions. Two questions. Um, yeah. The original window on LPC eight, the detail. It's really quite uh, ornate. You know, it's, it's, it, it has a different profile than the details you're using. And the question is, why not replicate that detail? That's A. Question B is the sill of the door and the sill of the side lights. Why not just keep them consistent? What was the thinking behind the inconsistency of that? Um. I'll answer the first question, then I need you to ask the second one again. The answer to the first question um, is that the uh, the existing windows were operable, and um, the the uh, new facade is fixed, so they're they have very different functions, and the, and therefore they would have different profiles to um, 
accommodate that. And um, and this the, the new facade would allow us to use insulated glass, which would be better for um, ther thermal efficiency of the space. Um, so it's a more modern uh, facade, and um, and consequently doesn't require uh, all of the detail that the old operable um, sashes you uh, needed. Can you ask me your second but, question again about this? Well, uh, well, well the, the, the issue is basic one of your new doorway will be there for another 50 years. And I'm asking if you can replicate that wonderful section of the jam. And you can, I mean, it, it, it can be done. And I, I think it would add to this doorway. The second question is the sill, the door sill, eight inch, I think it is that you have there and the sill of the side lights are inch and a half or two inches. Why not make it consistent all the way across? What was the thinking of the inconsistency of that? It's just, it would be nicer for the clean line going across now. I think of it. Um, right, so the, the bottom not... rail of your door, right? The bottom rail of your door is probably what, six inches high, but you have no, sort of base to the adjacent windows, the side Okay, lighting. now I understand the question, sure. And elevationally, yeah, well, yeah. this is, right. This is not a, this is not a custom made uh, storefront. This is a, this is a manufactured by a very good manufacturer. And uh, they have certain um, styles, certain things we can select from. And this is the door which provides the largest uh, amount of glass area. And, you know, we felt that to have the ABA rhythm of the door versus a window uh, was, was okay, was appropriate. But I do believe that we could modify the side lights and have a taller um, fr frame on the bottom and hold that line across. We, we felt maximizing glass area for the um, interior view was... Um, was appropriate and, and beneficial to the tenant and a door is a door and a window is a window. So, but it could be done. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, you were talking about simplicity and uh, the uh, line and so forth of the window. Uh, you know, however, our concern is more the preservation of historic material. And uh, my question is, could you not uh, maintain the upper windows as they are and keep those historic bronze windows in place and then just uh, uh, recess the lower portion and redesign the lower portions so as to have the door space that you need? It would be a more complicated design perhaps, but at least you could retain um, the upper proportions and uh, the existing historic bronze. We did consider that commissioner and um, we felt that because the width of the door could not match that it was better to make that transition uh, make that change uh, between the ornamental panels above and the glass frames below. Um, it is less jarring to see that happen at the top um, than it would be to see it happen uh, between the middle and lower levels that are very, that are very similar in vocabulary. So we, we did look at it, but this, this was superior in our, in our opinion. Uh, did you, when you were looking at that, did you perhaps look at the issue of possibly um, having smaller skylight um, side lights and a larger door, which would then, you know, it'd be a different proportion? But uh, no, we we did not look at having a larger door because the 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 wider the door, the further the um, storefront would have to be set in in order to meet the eighteen inch projection code. So we were trying to Thank make you. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just following up on Commissioner Chapin's question, if you were to, and, and I don't know that this is the right answer, but just sort of thinking through all the options, if you were to do 
a double door, could one then keep the alignments and would each leaf then actually together meet your required opening and actually have um, less swing onto the sidewalk? In other words, maybe if you had an automatic opener, could two smaller leaves of a double door that maintains this configuration, could that serve to meet the code requirements? Uh, I don't believe so because there, there's a, a minimum leaf demand. If you do, this is an egress door for this space. So you would still have a minimum dimension for a single leaf and uh, keeping the facade at the same line it is, would, it, would still, um, it would still have to go back a little bit for that to work. 32 inches is the minimum uh, clear for a single leaf. So it wouldn't be enough to do that. Okay. All right, other questions? Okay, I think we don't have any other questions at this time, so we'll move to public testimony. So anyone who's in the meeting who would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And we will start with anyone who signed up in advance and I'll turn it over to Lisa Kersavage to walk us through the testimony. Okay, thank you. We had one person sign up to speak, which is Kelly Carroll, who I've brought in. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. A hallmark of high-rise Art Deco style buildings is the grandiose announcement of the entrance to the building. Currently, two other retailers are accessed from the vestibule via the stylish main entrance of this building. And HDC is curious why this solution is not plausible for the prospective tenant. If the LPC deems it appropriate to create a secondary entrance and carve into the facade on Franklin Street, details of this entry require refinement. These detail, details include a closer match in profile and dimension to the original vertical elements, exploring retaining more of the granite water table or incorporating a bulkhead and considerations and deliberations about reversibility. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, and Rich, do we have any written testimony? We do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 1 recommending denial of the application citing the loss of original fabric. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so, Mr. Zwigard, is there anything else you'd like to say? Would you like to respond to any of the comments or make any final comments of your own? Yes, I'd like to respond to Kelly's comment. We, uh, <clears throat> we did look at the idea of making the cut in the granite base only the width of the three foot door in the middle so that there would be these kind of wings um, coming into the opening. And uh, because we, we, we did understand that would be less of cutting of the base. But the problem with that is that because of the, the recess, it would create two um, ledges or benches, if you will, on the sides of the, um, of the, uh, of the door. And we felt that that would be a place that people may sit or put things uh, that really wouldn't be desirable. And so um, again, with the idea of the, uh, the clean, simple opening um, matching what happens on Church Street, we decided to make the cut in the granite the full width. Okay. All right, commissioners, any final questions? Okay, and I am right now starting to request to unmute you all so that we can move to close, oops, move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. So Commissioner Halford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll begin our discussion. And so the first question is, um, you know, whether or not it's okay to, or appropriate to modify an opening to create an entrance on this facade, um, which, you know, the commission has done where it has involved removal of plain uh, stone bases. And um, 
but you know, looking at the building as a whole, that's the first question. Then the second question is if it is found to be appropriate to create an entrance on this side, um, you know, how do we accomplish these issues dealing with the fact that there's historic fabric and how much of it can we retain, what the details and configuration of the door are to best relate to the existing um, infill. So, um, Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, I I think cutting the opening is fine. It's, it, it, and I think the, the, the idea of pushing the door back is a good one. My concern is basically in detail. I think this is going to be here for quite a while. And I think the detail of the existing window is still I mean, they're quite handsome. And I thought maybe they could be replicated here rather than a simple aluminum frame and window that we see. And I, I simply thought that the, the, the sill could be extended across to just simplify that. But I think on a whole it works. I mean, it, it, it bothers me that there isn't an alignment with the fascia piece that, that you push back and the window. But I can't see how you can solve that. So I, I, I recommend thinking about the detail of the, the vertical particularly. And, and see how you could make that, have that, 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 that uh, profile and, and, and simplify the bottom of the door. That's, that, those are my comments. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson? Um, I, I, I'm okay with converting the window to a door uh, to, and, uh, and, I, and I appreciate the preservation of that, uh, uh, the detail at the top uh, and the signage is fine. Um, but I, I would um, I would take that that first the, the middle section and keep it exactly in the in the configuration that it is now, so that the um, uh, the recessed part is simply the bottom part. And I think they got to work with staff. It sounds like there are any number of ways to try to figure out how to get that alignment to to at least look better. Um, and I, it's never going to be exactly perfect, but. Um, but I, I think they really ought to work with staff on that. And I think, um, you know, it's one of those situations where the, 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 um, the, the, uh, um, all of these pieces are much, have a much greater dimension than what they're replacing it with. Um, and so I, that's why I do like um, Commissioner Jefferson's suggestion of uh, uh, making the, uh, uh, the bottom the same thickness as well, because it needs that, that greater dimension. Um, but I think that they'll be able to, I think they'll be able to figure that out by working with staff. Um, uh, but I but I do think that the the entire thing ought to have um, uh, much greater um, thickness. Okay, more thickness and detail, and just recess the portion below the the right. window that is not operable. That's right. Okay. Oh, by the way, and I also think I, one other thing, which is that you know I you know I, I think the building you know deserves a I, I understand they have may only be a certain number of stock doors out there. But I think the building deserves a door that actually um, it may need to be custom made, but it, you know it's, it deserves the right door. Right, to have the right details. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I agree with that last comment, uh, John's last comment about this being a custom door. I don't think this is. I, I think that whatever whatever profiles we're wanting to have them achieve a, a, a more detail and a more refined uh, profile will happen only in a custom door. But the other issue really is this one of aligning with the um, decorative spandrel piece above. And it's I, I find it really a problem that it doesn't. And so what I was trying to get at is that, you know, maybe the ver two verticals in the middle get thicker so that they, you know, their center lines or something meet uh, mm -hmm. up with that, with that spandrel dividing those two dividing lines in the spandrel, yeah. maybe, and, and maybe that's, that's wrong in the end because it'll look so different from what the original was if there really are these two thick pieces. Alternatively, that the door is somehow different from the upper, upper panels um, and that it's 36, but the upper ones return to the, you know, A, 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 A. And I, you know, I just don't know how to resolve that, but I do think it's so important. And I, I think without being able to achieve it, I think we really are compromising these these openings, windows slash doors. So 
I'm, I'm struggling with that. So if, if uh, as Commissioner Gustafson has suggested, you keep the historic fabric at the fixed window portion, yeah. you'd naturally be maintaining more alignment that way as well as historic fabric. And then maybe the recessed door, because it's recessed and not the full opening, maybe that alignment isn't as perceptible because it's in a different plane and it's, it's not the entire opening. Um, but then with the horizontal, would the horizontal band be um, heavier just in the middle piece? Yeah, I think all of you have talked about uh, making sure that the details more accurately reflect what fabric would be retained. So yeah, we'd have I to study that, that as well. Cool. Yes, I understood that. Okay. I think that's a better quote, but it's not ideal. Okay. I know. Okay. Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, yes, I think since this is such a simple deco building that the details are really important. Um, and I agree with the concept of keeping the, the top sort of clear glass transom at the, in the same plane, maintaining the original bronze material yeah. and setting the door back at that point. And perhaps, perhaps the whole bottom is glass. There's, maybe there's no framing so that the, the reading is much finer. So you don't see the misalignment as much. Um, but I do think they need to study that better. And um, also, you know, the, the original bronze will have gone to the height of the, um, the granite base. And so if they cut that back, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a way to, to maintain the rest of that, that bronze material to the, to the extent possible, but, okay. All right, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, um, as I said before, I, I, or was inquiring before, I agree uh, with uh, what uh, Commissioner Gustafson was talking about, which is that we would retain the upper portion uh, so that you preserve both the material and the historic alignment of that upper section and then figure out a way to deal with the lower section, which is, uh, you know, best tries to uh, preserve some of the uh, appropriate, um, you know, verticals and proportions. We shouldn't be talking, you know, this is not something where you can just use, uh, you know, something that you can get off the shelf. And, you know, it's too important a door and it's too important. If we're permitting cutting a new door here, uh, it really should be done right. And it may be that you're going to increase the, um, the door in some way, or as Commissioner Holford Smith suggested just a moment ago, I had also that is a possibility. You could actually just have entirely glass uh, below. Um, I am interested also in preserving any, if we can preserve some of the bronze down below. I don't have a picture of the original door in front of me right now. I mean, original window in front of me right now. So, uh, but we really need to have the staff work with, uh, the, uh, thank you, the applicant and try to preserve, you know, have the details be as uh, match as best as they can the historic configuration. And in particular, I, I definitely want to preserve that upper, that upper portion and then get the door and the side lights to align in a fashion that works best once you do that. And uh, that really just needs some work, obviously. So I don't okay. know, is that, is that enough? <laughs> no, I think that helps. Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, I agree with Diana. I think that um, just to add a uh, more noise to the process, I, I'm a little bit concerned that if we continue the granite base across as some people suggested it, in, in the current position, there might be an ADA problem. <laughs> um, uh, one yes. thing that might be considered uh, is to use a frameless system for the recessed new portion so that if you're not going to get it to a line, at least you're going to be suppressing the emphasis on that misalignment. Um, but again, this is the, the, the you know, something for the work with staff. And I think that uh, the only other thing I would suggest is that the 
width of the sign band be restricted to the width of the opening below it. Right now it's shown as kind of bleeding over a little bit. And the building is so elegant and kind of understated that I think the proliferation of signage is regrettable. It's necessary, but it's regrettable, I guess. <clears throat> so I would suggest that it be restricted to the width of the, uh, the opening below. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Well, so many redesign options. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not going to pile on to the redesign options, but I do agree with Michael about the, uh, the sign ban. And I agree in general that, you know, we've got a, we've got a very valuable facade and we're trying to put a puny $20 uh, stock door into this thing. I think it, at a minimum, it needs to be custom designed and I think the applicant can follow some of the suggestions of the, the commissioners and a redo is necessary. Okay, <laughs> Commissioner Chen. Uh, uh, just not to pile on or add more noise to the conversation. I think the, all those suggestions are valid and I think uh, I don't want to confuse further by giving the applicant additional headache. So I, I think the, you know, it could be refined. I think the concerns are valid, the alignment and the base uh, and all those motion, um, you know, options are, are on the table. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Well, I'm going to follow the uh, Devonshire procedure, which is um, uh, I'll be maybe the second not to redesign this thing. Uh, I, I will say maybe never have we spent an hour redesigning a doorway, but so be it. It's an important doorway. I think it can be there, uh, first of all. Um, and I think the signage looks pretty good. Uh, I've heard a lot of interesting ideas, but I think our job is not to design it. And I'm not going to pretend to design it. Uh, and I think the uh, applicant, from my mind, has to go back. I'd like to see it again, frankly. There are just too many options on the table, and it's important. So I uh, should take these, uh, all these good ideas, um, some better than others, some might work better than others, and come back to us with a, a scheme. Uh, I think it's too much. Okay. Just go around and, and design it for them. <clears throat> okay. And Commissioner Lutfi, any final thoughts for you? Yeah, I happen to agree with that. We now have a, lot, a number of interesting options. Everybody seems to be on the same page in terms of what the priorities are. Um, so I think, I think the applicants should go back to the drawing board, but, but working very closely with staff because, I, you know, I think some options, you know, as we've heard may be better than others, even though it might seem that one might work, but you know, so I think the staff yeah. will help will help um, guide them. I do also agree that this probably needs a custom door. And once we start, um, once you know, I don't have a problem with Michael's suggestion about the signage. It makes sense, but then I think. You have to make sense. You have to make sure that the other signage makes sense proportionately to what's below it. So I would just add that in. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, all commissioners. And I, I think that um, Commissioner Luffy, you're right. We've had a, kind of a lot of suggestions, but they get to the essence of the problem here, which is about sort of trying to retain what we can and making sure that the new door has a good relationship in terms of alignment and details. And um, so I think we will take no action. We'll ask the applicants to think about the different options and suggestions. Maybe they come up with some other suggestions and work with staff carefully um, in choosing which plan to come back to us with. Um, so we'll take no action and we'll move to the next item. Okay, the you. next item is number six. This is LPC 21-03819, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1248, lot one, 140 Riverside Drive in the Riverside West End Historic District. A modern style apartment building with Italian Renaissance style inspired details designed by Emery Roth and Sons and built in 1938-39. The application is to modify a masonry opening and install a window. 
The commissioners, the uh, applicant has joined the hearing. Um, you now have control of the presentation. You can click to advance the slides. Um, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julie Kalberer. Um, okay, there we go. All right, this is, um, this is the Normandy apartment building on Riverside Drive and 86th Street. Um, it's an Emory Roth building built in 1939. It's an individual landmark and it was, uh, the master plan was done in 1992. The location of the new opening is taking place in the living room of our client's apartment. Um, this drawing shows on the left-hand side, uh, the existing, let me see. Well, let, let me say first, we're not in the habit of proposing changes to a master plan generally, um, but in this instance, uh, we thought it was warranted and would result in an improvement because of an imbalance in the fenestration pattern that exists on the Riverside Drive facade. Um, if you look at these two elevations, the left is existing, and this right one is our proposal, which is right here, uh, laid over the uh, master plan. Um, we're proposing to make one large combined opening in this location on the 20th floor. Uh, and this location is up high, but you can see it from both Riverside Drive and also from uh, the park. Uh, in general in the building, you can see the fenestration, um, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, the fenestration on the towers uh, is symmetrical, but the section in the middle, which is where our project is, um, which is also set back roughly 20 feet from the face of the towers. The section in the middle was never symmetrical, um, but it did have a balance. <laughs> uh, this very top drawing here um, shows the 1939 fenestration. This is our opening area. This was what was originally there. Okay, if you go down to this third drawing, this shows what is existing today. This is our location of the proposed opening. And this is what the neighbors have done. Um, now they did this work before 1992. So the master plan that was done incorporated their, this larger opening. Um, and this bottom drawing shows the neighbor's larger opening and the master plan. This also shows our proposal, which is to mimic that. Um, it, before, I mean, I, I think that you can see that um, this, eleva this elevation right here has an imbalance in the fenestration. Um, and we're trying to help change that. Um, this bottom, let me see, this bottom photo here uh, the bottom left photos, both take from Riverside Drive. This is the actual view when you're standing on the sidewalk, this one right here. And this is a telephoto blow up um, showing the area um, also from the sidewalk, but not really a nat natural view of it. But it does give a pretty good view of our situation and where we are. Um, you can see how the existing fenestration pattern looks out of balance. Uh, and all, all of the details of our proposed window are going to mimic the, um, are going to be the typical type C outswing window, casement window, which is prescribed by the master plan. Uh, also note that there are no special features that we are, um, uh, this is plain brick up on this level. And so a change in this opening does not affect any of the special features at all um, on the building. These are just some, various photos showing that you, you can see it, but it's up high. I'm gonna go back to this drawing. Um, so down here is, is our proposal. So in summary, I'd just like to say that the 20th floor already has a regular fenestration um, and the 1992 master plan has already incorporated the neighbor's larger window opening into the window pattern going forward. Uh, what we are proposing is to make the same larger opening as the neighbor and to use the same window type is already exists typically on the facade. By doing this, I believe the result will be a more harmonious and appropriate fenestration pattern that will look more balanced and more in keeping with the overall building elevation. Thank you. Okay. 
thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I don't see any questions at this time, so we'll move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. Um, and if you're in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your virtual hand and I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to walk us through the testimony. Okay, thank you. We'll start with uh, Michelle Parker. Michelle, I've brought you in. Thank you, Michelle Parker, co-chair preservation CB7, where this application lies. We approved this application uh, unanimously, we meaning the board, uh, because we found that um, the proposed new window openings will be more harmonious with the windows to the north and below. We felt that this harmonization will be an improvement over the existing condition and is therefore appropriate to the character of this individual landmark. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And next, uh, Shankar Sandy. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee recognizes that even with a Windows Master Plan, changes to be expected. The architects are proposing a window that matches material function and form of the Master Plan, but adding a bay. The configuration seems to match the CC option of the Greater 1992 Master Plan. Given that this is so high up on a setback level where there are pre-existing alterations to a neighboring unit, that this will someday match, our committee feels this can be appropriate. Had this been on a lower floor or in the plane of the primary street facade, we would likely not be in such agreement. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee recommends approval of this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I don't see anybody else with their hand raised. Okay, thank you. And Rich, do we have any written testimony? No other additional written testimony. Okay, thank you. All right. So I think um, we've heard pretty supportive comments. I don't know if there's any final comment you'd like to make before we move to our discussion. No, I'm, I'm good, thank you. Okay, great. And commissioners, are, are there any final questions? Okay, so we'll move to our discussion and uh, Commissioner Latvi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you and Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any, aye. Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and, and we'll begin our discussion. And I think the applicant did a very nice job explaining the existing conditions and, um, and, and how the proposed window would fit within that. So, um, Commissioner, um, who hasn't had a, had a chance to read yet? <laughs> Let me see, Commissioner. Um, Shamir Barron, why don't you start this one? Uh, um, it, it seems to me that it's reasonable. I mean, I, again, I think that the, the question about modifying master plan is, is a problem, but beyond that, I don't think it's um, terribly visible or makes it a, a negative impact on the facade. So I think I could approve it as proposed. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Commissioner Halford-Smith? Yeah, I agree. I think this is appropriate. It actually um, helps to regularize the window openings on that floor and will really not be noticeable from the street regardless. And I think as a change to the master plan, it makes sense. I can approve it. Okay, Commissioner Chapin? Uh, yeah, yes, I agree with uh, Commissioner Holford-Smith. This is, uh, it's, an, it's improving actually the, the uh, configuration and I can find it appropriate. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Goldblum? I agree. Uh, uh, the interesting thing about it is that I think it brings up the, the, the issue that we sometimes do run across, which is the urge to improve on an original building. <laughs> um, and I think that generally that's appropriate to resist an urge that's appropriate to resist. But here, because of its visibility uh, and because it, it, it doesn't seem to have a major impact on the overall perception of the design, I think it's okay. And Commissioner Devonshire? 
Yeah, I, I agree with Michael. If this thing wasn't 400 feet off the ground, I wouldn't be in favor of it, but I can approve it. Okay. And Commissioner Chen? It's appropriate. Okay. And Commissioner Bland? Agree. It's appropriate. Okay. And Commissioner Lutfi? I agree. It looks more balanced than harmonious. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson? I agree with my fellow commissioners. Okay, and Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I, I agree, but I also want to thank the applicant for uh, for accurately describing the visibility and not trying to uh, hide it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we have a consensus to approve um, in this case. And so Commissioner Shamir Baron, would you make that motion? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, or so moved are we making the motion i'm reading it yes yeah okay you're reading it. thank you okay yes um i'll concede 140 riverside drive the normandy apartment riverside west end historic district um sorry a modern style apartment building with italian renaissance style inspired details designed by Henry roth and sons and built in 1938 to 39 the application to modify the masonry opening and install a window I note the building is an individual landmark as well as a building whose style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Riverside West End Historic District, and I recommend approval. Finding that the proposed work will not eliminate any significant architectural features, that the modified masonry opening will only remove a limited amount of plain brickwork, that the existing windows at the recessed central place in the 19th floor penthouse do not presently align, with the fenestration of the building below. Therefore, the combination of the masonry openings will not further diminish the relationship of the 19th floor to the building's overall fenestration pattern. That the proposed window will match the type C master plan window in terms of configuration, operation details, and finish, and thereby help to support a unified fenestration pattern. And that the work will not diminish the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Riverside West End Historic District. Okay, and Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, and Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. That's approved. Thank you. Thank and you we'll move to the next item. Okay, and uh, noting that items 7, 8, and 9 were previously read into the record to be presented at a future date, we will now move to the last item of the day, item number 10, LPC 21-03229. Application for a Certificate of Appropriateness in the Borough of Manhattan, Block 544, Lot 72, 27 East 4th Street in the NoHo Historic District Extension. A garage and repair shop designed by Herman Crone and built in 1945 to 46. The application is to demolish the existing building and construct a new building. And if I may, I just want to uh, read one more item into the record. Uh, it was previously listed as such on the agenda, but I'll just reinforce that now. Uh, and that is LPC 21-03913, 211 East 48th Street, the Lascaz House Individual Landmark. That will also be presented at a future uh, future date. Thanks. And commissioners, the um, applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, you now have control of the presentation. Um, please remember to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you may begin. Can everyone hear me? Uh, George Schieffer Decker, BKSK. Paul Rubin after GMS. Hi, Joe Vavino, BKSK. Joe, we haven't got the presentation up yet. Presentation is up. You'll just need to click on the screen to begin advancing the slides, and you may do so uh, at this point. I'm clicking right now. Oh, there we go. Click the mouse. Hmm. Is it advancing? Not, okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair, Commissioners, 
Good afternoon. My name is George Schieferdecker, and I am with uh, BKSK Architects. I have with me Joe Vivino of BKSK, who will handle the screen sharing duties. We also have with us Carl Rubenacher from GMS Structural Engineers, who will address structural issues relative to the construction impact of our project on our neighbor, the Merchant's House Museum, which, uh, as everyone knows, is an important uh, individual landmark. A building for this site was proposed earlier by the owner. The design was for a hotel and required a bulk variance in order to incorporate a street wall at eight stories with no setback. The design received approval from the Landmarks Preservation Commission and the City Planning Commission, but was turned down at the City Council. We are returning now with a proposed design for a seven story commercial building, six stories, and a setback seven story in full conformance uh, with New York City zoning. Next. A one-story garage building currently occupies the site. It was constructed in 1945 and replaced a four and a half story townhouse. The existing garage building is a single story unadorned brick facade with a large garage door opening. The building was described in the previous LPC approval language as quote, not representative of the buildings for which the historic dis district was designated and therefore its demolition was approved. We are similarly proposing its demolition as part of our project. Next. The site is located on East 4th Street between the Merchant's House Museum to the east and a classic nine story loft building to the west. At the rear of the site is an historic alleyway that is not a public way. On the left are views of the site from the east top and from the west bottom. On the right are views of the rear of the site and down the leg of the alley that extends to the Bowery. Next. <clears throat> next. 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 Thank you. The following images remind us of what was on our site prior to the one-story garage building. Up until the early 1940s, the site was occupied by a four and a half story townhouse. And these images serve as a reminder of the residential character of the neighborhood in its earliest days. That character was slowly supplanted by the taller industrial loft building so typical of the NoHo historic district. It is useful to note also the stepping up in scale from the merchant's house that even this earlier four-story townhouse embodied. As I hope to demonstrate, our proposed design works in a contemporary aesthetic to recollect this residential history, the loft building character of the district and the stepping up in street wall scale. Next. This sheet shows the previous proposal on the left and our current proposal in the center with a section through it on the right. The primary difference between our current proposal and the previous design, other than its obvious materiality and facade design, is the number of stories and its single floor setback. As of right zoning mandates a setback after a certain maximum height or number of stories, whichever is less, the setback provides a lower street wall presence and as I mentioned, hints at the historic stepping up of the building massing from the merchant's house to our building and then to our other neighbor to the west, the nine story industrial loft building. The street wall height to the top of the cornice is 84 feet. The overall building height is 94 feet five. Street wall height is 11 feet lower than the previous scheme. The overall height remains the same and the setback is 20 feet. Next. These images are displayed to show the setback portion of our building and to make clear the fact that current zoning, which obviously dictates building massing in our time is already in evidence on East 4th with the new corner building at the end of our block. Historically, buildings in the district were continuous on their street wall for their full height, and the previous proposal had sought to preserve that character through a variance. We are limiting our building to a single setback floor to allow the street wall presence of the building to clearly dominate over the setback portion and acknowledge the historic character of street walls in the district as much as possible. As a result of the Zoning mandated six story maximum height before setback and the decision to have a single setback floor. Our proposed design is one story less than the previous proposal, but deeper on the site to utilize the full floor area ratio. Next. I think our proposal is well within the scale of the block. Uh, our block is marked by a diversity from the lower townhouse to the ample scale of industrial loft style buildings and the very unique commercial buildings of Lafayette Street. With a reduced street wall presence, our proposal falls in a middle ground between the scale of our two neighbors. Next. 
The same diversity of scale plays out on the other side of the uh, of East Fourth, with townhouses to the east and the substantial silt building a block over to the west. Our proposal scale, our proposed scale, is superimposed on the profile of the other side of the street, and you can see it there, shaded in red. Next. The elements of our proposed design are drawn from the character of the NoHo historic districts and the historic districts in close proximity to the site. Materiality. Terracotta is a material that has a long history in this area and indeed in the city and has been quote unquote rediscovered and transformed in our time as contemporary architecture has found new and innovative uses and constructions for it. Moving left to right are Louis Sullivan's Bayard Conduct Building, which remains an enduring touchstone for us in its use of terracotta ornament. The Little Singer Building with its use of terracotta and a metal armature that presages the current terracotta rain screen technologies. And our own 529 Broadway previously approved by the commission that exploits current technologies for the fabrication of terracotta to create a contemporary quote unquote ornateness. Coloration. The use of molded brick with its enduring character up against materials with a similar coloration is also a theme seen often in the district. The Divini Press building on the corner of East 4th and Lafayette has a red clay decorative terracotta screen at its entrance surrounded by molded red brick. The classic use of a richly toned molded brick on the merchant's house is also an important reference. Next. Our proposed design uses these elements in a contemporary expression. It is important to note that while some of our cited examples are very distinctive buildings, we have tried to be simple, understated and straightforward with our contemporary expression. We think it is important that we don't quote unquote compete with a merchant's house and that we thereby recognize its importance to the streetscape, but also that we remain clear about the architecture of our building as of our time. With that in mind, our design proposes an aesthetic of a basic brick facade with punched openings and a language of terracotta screen elements and metal trim. The brick of the face of the building is a modeled molded brick contrasted to a lot line brick, also molded that is more monochromatic and plain. This is a subtle inversion of a traditional use of brick where the randomly modeled and utilitarian brick was used on the lot line and a more polished and uniform brick on the face. Also, we have found that the historic richness of brick is better recalled with the modeled brick types available today than with any monochromatic brick. So we are preferencing use of a very graded brick on the facade. The terracotta screen elements or baguettes within metal framing construction sit in front of triple hung windows that extend down to the floor of each story. The terracotta screen elements are also used to make a pronounced cornice and a facade for the setback top floor. The terracotta pieces are custom glazed with a variegated pattern. Coloration of the brick and the terracotta are similar, but they are differentiated one from the other by the quality of the two materials as per some of the historic examples we cited. A charcoal colored metal is used as the armature for the terracotta screen elements, as well as full pilasters and cornice type trim. A gray granite is used at the base where the most durable of materials is called for. Next. Moving from the bottom of the building up. The scale of the base is in keeping with a commercial building of the district with a floor to floor height of 16.5 and a 12 foot high storefront. The doors are nine feet, six inches tall. Jet mist granite is used at the base for the brick at the sides and for the metal pilasters. Metal fins form the sides of the inset metal pilasters and an inset metal signage band at the 12 foot height. The metal trim at the sides and at the pilasters and a half, is a half inch material to give a sense of slimness to the profiles. The terracotta screen elements sit in front of the metal trim initially, then in front of the windows of the second floor and a horizontal metal cornice element defines that transition in the top of the storefront. The entrance for the upper floors is the second bay from the left. The furthest left window is acid etched glass obscuring the fire stair behind it. And the middle right bay is the entrance to the commercial lower ground floor. Next. The middle floors have tall triple hung windows with the lowest pane fixed up to a sill height. The terracotta screen sits in front of the window to that sill height and in front of the metal pilasters between the windows at the sides. The terracotta screen elements are deliberately patterned at two different angles and arranged in a different order from section to section and top to bottom. 
This creates a certain dynamism and uniqueness to their presence. The depth of the facade to the windows is a foot to recall the deeply recessed facades of the district. The middle pilaster is devoid of the terracotta screen above the sill to mark the center of the composition of the facade elements. Next. The organization of the facade elements and their proportions are meant to serve a functional purpose and to recall the history of the site. The functional purpose of having a center pilaster and a four window reading is to allow a possible future division on the interior into two spaces. That organization is not unusual in the district as shown in the examples at the right on Great Jones Street, one block south. Generally windows in the buildings representative of the district character are grouped into a continuous horizontal reading side to side, whether an odd or an even number of days. The history of the site is subtly recalled in the window proportions that play over the facade with the terracotta screens overlapping the windows and the substantial dimension between windows, we recall a residential residential window proportion, the ghost of the townhouse that used to occupy the site. With the overall size of the windows and behind the screens and the continuity side to side, we allude to the window proportions for the industrial loft buildings with which we probably share more of a kinship. Next. At the top of our pro proposed design, the terracotta screen becomes a cornice element. Louis Sullivan's Bayard Conduct building does this to, to great effect, and we are using that precedent with all due humility as a prototype for our very simple expression of turning our terracotta screen out onto the cornice. On the facade of the setback floor, we use the terracotta screening to link it to the facade expression of the rest of the building and provide an intriguing backdrop to the occupiable terrace. The facade brick is toothed into the lot line brick at the exposed southeast corner of our building and the metal trim of the cornice at the corner takes on that same dimension. Next. The rear of our building is a utilitarian expression utilizing the lot line brick and the metal trim with a reduced depth to the facade elements. The triple hung windows will have a translucent fixed pane to sill level. On the left is the previous design. On the middle at the center is ours. Please, please keep in mind that the uh, rear facade is visible from the private alley only. At the top right are the materials of the bulkheads and mechanical screening. They are standard metal siding with vertical reveals and metal louvers, both on the top of the front. Next. The view of our proposed design from the street, east and west, shows the stepping massing from the merchant's house to our proposed design to our neighbor 25 East 4th. I think it is important to make a point here regarding the street as a space in itself. We feel that our proposed proposal benefits the streetscape and the appearance of the merchant's house enormously. The merchant's house was never meant to be seen as a standalone building with missing teeth to either side. A continuous street wall is much more in keeping with the historic character of the district and its streets and benefits the reading of the merchant's house in an urban context, in, in an urban context substantially. Next. The previous proposal for the site is on the left and the current proposal is on the left as, uh, as on the right as we show um, a lot line configuration. Our design is a single story less in height and it is set back at the top floor. It is deeper on the site to utilize the full floor area ratio, full floor area ratio available. Also, it should be noted that the merchant's house has operable chimneys to its boiler as we understand currently and that those chimneys need to be carried up to the height of our building. We are proposing taking the flues into our building and running them up to preserve the existing roofscape and chimneyscape of the merchant's house up against our lot line. The exact determination of the height of these chimneys above our roof will depend on the equipment served. And we have reached out to the parks department to determine that spec, but have not yet gotten clarity. The chimneys are currently shown at a height of three feet above our parapet, and they could go as high as 10 feet. Next. The next portion of our presentation is devoted to structural considerations and issues. The overriding point that I wish to make as an introduction to the discussion of the structural design of this proposal is that the owner has been and remains totally committed to the preservation and protection of the merchant's house. We stand ready to continue to engage with the city in any reasonable and professional dialogue about safety measures and protections for the merchant's house. The previous proposal for this site involved a great deal of examination and discussion of the structure of our building. The supportive excavation designed for its cellar 
and its foundation design as regards their impact on the merchant's house. That design was thoroughly vetted at the time of the previous approval. That design remains exactly the same for this proposal adjacent to the merchant's house. The only substantial difference is that the current design is one floor less than the previous design and therefore in fact less massive adjacent to the merchant's house for its full length. Also reviewed at the time was the geotechnical report for the subsurface condition, the resulting information gleaned from test pits and vibration studies completed on the site and the construction phase monitoring plan. One very unique quality to our site is that the existing lot line walls of the original four and a half story townhouse remain intact above and below grade. You can see this condition in the images. All the construction of our proposal will be between the existing walls on our site and not the walls of any neighbor and not between any party walls. This affords an additional layer of protection for our neighbors that is unusual. I have with me Carl Rubenacher of Gilsons Murray and Stefik, GMS, the structural engineer for the original design and this proposed design who will explain these elements in greater detail. I'll turn it over to Carl. Thank you, George. And thank you commissioners for listening today. Um, appreciate the opportunity. So this slide here shows the, as George mentioned, the, the, um, the condition in the 1960s and then the current condition showing the lot line wall at the merchant's house, um, it, which has been surveyed. And you see that in the survey that the wall is protruding onto our side approximately one foot. The other thing that you find in the section is you see the existing, the original basement is probably about, is about six, seven feet down from grade. And that's still there, it's broken up. Um, the remains of the original four story townhouse. Next slide. Um, when this project started many years ago, there was a, a survey of the site and a test pits dug. So these, this slide is showing the test pits that were dug on the east side of the site. The lower one, cross section one, occurred right next to the Merchant's House Museum. And you can see the, the, um, the footing. We found out the bottom of the footing it's six foot eight inches down from the from the grade, and then on cross section two is the footing at the rear of the site, which you know Merchant's House considers is their garden wall, so called garden wall. Really, that's the that's the wall of our building. That's a lot line wall of our building. Uh, next slide, please. Um, with the original um, investigations, there was a geotechnical investigation. Of course, there were two borings dug. And the borings showed that the, the um, bedrock is approximately 40 feet down. Um, just above that, slightly above that is the groundwater table. So the groundwater is quite deep. And then the site is ma mainly underlain by glacial sands. Okay, the original glacial sands that, that, the, um, that exists um, and that's what the subgrade is. So that's a, the class three, that's a stiff, soil profile, and it's, it's good for, for two and a half or three tons per square foot of bearing, and it's, it's a good subgrade. Above that is the backfill of the original basement. So the, um, the top layer of soil on the side is actually the rubble and the debris that they threw into the site back in the 40s when the original building was demolished. Um, next slide. Next slide. This is a plan view with North is on the right, Merchant's House is down on the bottom. Um, and highlighted in color, you can see the existing green lot line walls that will remain in place um, during the construction. That's one salient feature. The other feature is that um, the new building will be, um, will be framed in steel and all of the weight will be carried in the steel. So we won't be loading the existing masonry walls with additional gravity load or lateral load. Um, the building is founded on a mat foundation, and that mat foundation will step up when we get close to the Merchant House Museum so that we are, you know, at the level of the existing foundation, we don't go below it. Um, the anticipated settlement by the map is, is approximately 3 sixteenths of an inch, which is quite small. Um, realize that the, just the simple excavation that we're doing of the existing backfill um, is a similar order of magnitude as the weight of the building. Um, because we're going down approximately six foot eight inches down to the original cellar level and then 
towards the west and towards the north, we're digging down further. Um, so there's a, the, the mass of the excavation is, is quite significant. Um, and then the other thing to mention is that the new, merch, new building will provide shielding at the merchant house, that that missing tooth will be filled back in. Um, so that'll be a good thing. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a cross section showing the design of the new building, the lower stories. You can see again, the green lot line walls um, on the left and the right. This is a section looking north adjacent to the Merchant's House Museum. Um, interesting thing, the Merchant's House Museum itself has dug down a cellar level at some point in the past. I don't know what point that was. Um, so we're, we're actually doing a similar thing, except we're not loading the masonry wall. Um, you can see in blue, the new mat foundation, which is meant to carry the entire weight of the new building. Um, as I mentioned, this building is framed in steel and the steel will be in boards, in boards of the existing masonry walls and then just carried up. And as we go up, as we get above the masonry wall, we're gonna step out so we can take advantage of, of, of the property, right? Keeping within the, the seismic separation, but taking advantage of it. The brick wall that you saw in, in George's slide before, the lot line walls, those will be carried on the steel as well. So, so we're not gonna load the existing green walls. We're gonna, they're just gonna stay there um, protected. Okay, the other thing to notice here is that the second floor is just below the existing roof structure. So um, the, the, the cellar, the ground floor, and the second floor will all be constructed within the existing footprint and volume of the existing garage. Um, so much of that work can happen while that garage is still in place. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a slide. Some thought has been, some, a lot of thought has been got, has gotten into the sequence of construction and the sequence of excavation um, to do everything that's reasonable to keep the site stable. So this is a plan and what you see here is, is again, you see the, the area of raised foundation in blue on the left. Um, what's additional here is that the, we're showing the, to, to retain that raised area, there's going to be drilled in, aug augured in piles with lagging. Okay, so just to, to keep a supportive excavation for that area. Um, and then the wide area will be excavated deeper. Um, in addition to that, that's not normally used on construction. We're going to have those red beams that go across. They're going to brace laterally, keep where the old, approximately where the old ground floor was, there's, there's going to be braces that hold the site open. Um, we anticipate the load in those should be zero, but we're putting them in um, as a precaution. Um, there's a sequence from right to left and um, that's all worked out. I, I won't bore you with the details, but, but there is a sequence that has, you know, one piece of mat poured after the other and we march along from basically from, from north to south um, in, in, a rough, in a rough sense. Um, there is some small, small, some small amount of underpinning of our lot line walls, um, but not the neighbors. Next slide, please. This is a cross section again showing the sequence. You can see the W, the, the braces and their relation. Um, so just at the top of the brace on the left, that's approximately where the existing grade is. So, so the basic sequence of construction is that we're going to, the contractor is going to remove the interior. There's a couple interior partitions. Um, they'll demolish the slab on grade. They'll excavate down to, um, the level of the original basement. So we're not, no, up, up higher. See, this is a dotted line right there. That's where the original basement line was. So, you know, before 1945, that's where the air was, right? So should be okay to dig down there, no problem, right? That was already excavated in the past. We're going to re-excavate it. We're going to put in auger piles. Um, you can see them over, yeah, right there. They'll hold up that little step in the in the soil um, they'll be lagging there and then once that's in um, it's protected mind you the roof is still in place the existing roof structure is still in place while it's all protected they're going to cast the map foundation and then we're off to the races um, once the once the structure gets up to the second floor to, to the second floor level just below the existing roof then the existing roof can be removed and then, and then the, the construction proceeds. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
during construction, there's also precautions taken. Um, obviously we'll follow TPPN 10 of 88. We're going to go above and beyond it. Um, there'll be various forms of monitoring. There's displacement monitoring, so by survey, um, which can be by automatic total station. That'll just keep surveying things constantly. Um, that's the first thing. Um, you can see here, if we, if we go into the details, there's the what TPPN requires in the red. Green is what we'll do for the merchant house, and then black is what we'll do for the other neighbors. Um, but basically, there's a continuous survey of the merchant house. Um, for that, there's crack monitoring. If there's any cracks that we see on the masonry walls surrounding the site, they'll have crack monitors installed and monitored. Tilt monitoring, this is above and beyond. Again, we're going to install a tilt monitor on the merchant house just to confirm if there's any, any out of plane movement, which there shouldn't be. There's nothing that we're doing that would cause it. It's just a confirmation to make people feel comfortable. Um, vibration monitoring um, is going to happen on the adjacent buildings. Um, and then for the merchant's house, we're going to have a review threshold at uh, 0.2 inches per second. Okay. And then pre-construction survey, post-construction survey, all of that. That's it. Um, one thing to mention here is that we did do a baseline vibration monitoring of the merchant house back in 2012, 2013. That's how long we've been thinking about this project. Um, the monitors were in for approximately nine months from June of 2012 to March of 2013. And lo and behold, they recorded vibration events that are in the same order of magnitude as what our thresholds and our stop work limits are. Okay, so there was approximately a dozen events that were greater than half an inch a second, um, several dozen between 0.25 and 0.5 and several dozen between 0.15 and 0.25. So the natural ambient vibration is what we're talking about measuring in our vibration monitoring. So just to keep it in perspective. Um, so the building's already experiencing vibration without us. Okay, next. And then this is just an elevation in a plan showing the, the, all the various, this is a plan looking, elevation looking east. You see the merchant house, you see the lot line wall and then the various survey points and vibration monitoring points, um, and then the plan on the right. Thank you. Uh, so we have an appendix with uh, plans, elevations, and sections. It also in includes a sun study that was requested at the community board hearing to measure the impact of our building on the light for the rear garden of the merchant's house. Um, the sun study basically shows that there will be virtually no effect on sunlight to the garden as a result of our building because of the height um, uh, of our neighbor to, uh, to the uh, west. So that, it, that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Okay. Um, we'll move okay. On Thank you very much. Okay, commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? Yes, Commissioner Devonshire, please go ahead and just accept my request to unmute. Um, has the applicant done any condition assessments of the uh, Merchant's House Museum foundation wall or the brick facade walls, uh, including um, mortar analysis? Carl, do you want to answer the question uh, okay. about uh, the foundations? No, I don't believe that's happened yet. No, I mean, a pre-construction survey can happen you know, that's a prior to post-approval prior to construction item. Um, How can design proceed so far without knowing that information? Which, the information? The information about what, what constitutes the construction of the uh, foundation walls and the facade wall. We're, we're, not, we're not touching those walls. But there will be vibration, and the vibration will have an effect on the mortar and the masonry, correct? Perhaps. Um, okay. As I mentioned, Thank the you. Can I make uh, one additional point on that if we skip back to the introductory slide for the um, structural portion of the uh, presentation? Um, it's clear that the sidewall, which again, is on our site, that one, um, 
and is uh, our lot line wall has been substantially uh, worked over since the 1960 picture to the current picture so that we anticipate it's, um, its condition is uh, substantially uh, in, in good shape. But you did no analysis of it, is that correct? Of the Merchant's House oh. foundation walls? Of our foundation walls, there is Merchant's um, House all, foundation all walls. Test all test test. Test. Yeah. Okay. I think the question is, as you determined the protocol and the assessment for the excavation, did you look at the condition of the foundation walls on the merchant's house to inform those, um, inform those assessments about the monitoring and potential damage? Carl, you're gonna to have to answer that because I was not yeah. part of the previous if if probes right now those those foundations are hidden, right? They're they're on the merchant's house side. Um, no no test pits have been done on the merchant's house side. If if perhaps the merchant's house wants some test pits, we could we could take a look. But that hasn't okay. been done. But because that, but that would yeah. So it wasn't accessible. But wouldn't that be a critical piece of information in order to determine your assessments? We're not affecting those foundations. Not necessarily. Okay. Sarah, can we just skip to sheet 22 to? So just to be clear, I guess in the green is our wall, uh, which test pits work and has been done. And then the foundation of the merchant's house steps back into its own site. Okay. Okay. But you don't show the continuation of the Merchant's House Museum wall under that party wall. We don't believe it continues. We think that's it. It does continue. I've I've seen it. And okay. Never mind. We would be happy for that information. If that if there's un, additional information coming from the Merchant's I, House I side, would think it would great. be extremely valuable. We drew what we believe to be true. Okay. All right. Next question. Any other questions? All right. Not seeing any other questions. Um, I think we'll turn to public testimony. We have a number of people who have signed up to speak, and we want to make sure that we get to everyone, both people, including people who signed up to speak, as well as any others that have joined the meeting. So, I would ask everyone to respect the three minute time limit so that we can ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. And um, we will, as always, start with those who signed up in advance and then we will get to others. So if you can um, raise your hand in, and your virtual hand so that we can identify you, we will move through the testimony. And if you joined the meeting if you signed up in advance and joined the meeting with a different name, it will make it very difficult for us to find you. So please make sure that the name that you joined the meeting with is the same name used on the sign up sheet. And if it isn't, you can hit rename and, and fix that. So I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Lisa Krasavich, to walk us through the testimony. Lisa? Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll start with uh, Gail Brewer. And I'm going to bring you in as a panelist. So, Borough President, I brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Okay, Borough President. Um, Send a request to unmute. Okay, I think we'll return to the borough president. And move on to um, Shana Spence. OK, 
okay, Chanel, I brought you in. There you go. Just um, unmute yourself, please. And for everybody, if you could please um, state your name for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. I'm Chanel Spence, Chair of the Landmarks Committee for Community Board 2 Manhattan, and the properties, both properties fall within our district. Um, the commissioner who spoke addressed well our concerns about the merchant house integrity so far as structural is concerned. The interior of the house is virtually intact including considerable ornamental plaster from its construction. The house has really been never touched except for restoration and maintenance. Um, our concern beyond the structure is the ornamental plaster and other elements within uh, and the vibration question. Uh, the how you ensure against ornamental plaster of that age from 1832 uh, with this proposed construction is unclear and um, we feel that it's in great peril. Further, the visual impact of the sidewall as seen against from the east uh, has been magnified by the shift in bulk from the previous. The facade, we had great questions about the grill work, in particular, the, the parapet and it's extending as though a canopy over the sidewalk, and this appears to be totally without any precedent or historical reference or any other real reason to be as it is. The question of the garden is a magnification of the difficulties of the sidewall what I would like to do in conclusion, please, is to read our resolution. Okay, you have 40, 40 seconds. You could Therefore, be it resolved that CB2 Manhattan recommends denial of the application that with its excavation, construction, appearance, and bulk would cause irreparable aesthetic and structural harm to the Merchant's House Museum an individual exterior and interior landmark. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next, um, we have Matt Drury. Okay, Matt, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hi, greetings. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, uh, my name is Matt uh, Drury. I'm the uh, Director of Government Relations for New York City Parks, uh, New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, greetings to all the uh, commissioners and uh, obviously members of the public who are uh, testifying today. Uh, I'm here actually to read uh, a statement uh, by uh, our agency's yeah. Assistant Commissioner for Architecture and Engineering uh, for Capital Projects, uh, Vesna uh, Haji Babic. Uh, she couldn't make this, so I'm, I'm sort of reading in her stead. We've submitted it, so I, I, you know, I, I probably won't read the entire piece just to keep things moving along, uh, but just want to go through a couple quick things. You'll also be hearing from uh, you know, other, other important organizations who will, uh, so I don't want to, don't want to be too repetitive. So on that front, uh, just wanted to, regarding this public hearing item, uh, submit the following comments. Uh, New York, the city of New York uh, owns the adjacent property uh, at uh, 29th uh, East uh, 4th Street, also known as the Merchant's House Museum, which is under the jurisdiction of NYC Parks, uh, managed by uh, Old Merchant's House of New York uh, Incorporated. Uh, we believe the current proposal for 27 East uh, 4th Street will have tremendous impact and raise uh, many concerns uh, regarding the Merchant's House Museum, which have not uh, been uh, fully addressed by the uh, current proposal. Uh, along with our comments, we also submitted uh, some previous uh, engineering studies that have been uh, compiled in recent years. Uh, so we've you know, uh, submitted that, forwarded that for commissioner's uh, examination. And just want to note you know, some of the broader topics uh, that we believe require further 
uh, examination and discussion in terms of the monitoring and protection program. Um, you know, uh, I, I think uh, we need to hear more information about uh, the provisions being made in, uh, in accordance with uh, TPPN 1088 and, and Chapter uh, 33 of the NYC Construction Code to include structures within 90 feet. Um, you know, the, these elements that have been brought to developers' attention. Uh, you know, uh, provisions to make to ensure that a pre-construction survey uh, uh, for displacement, crack, vibration monitoring will be performed, uh, as indicated by these previous reports. Uh, in terms of foundation settlement, uh, the proposed design, uh, design has reduced the number of stories from eight to seven while retaining uh, a similar uh, building height. However, the building mass does seem to have increased uh, significantly. And uh, so the potential settlement calculations uh, haven't been uh, reflected in information available to NYC Parks for evaluation. So it's not possible to, uh, to evaluate whether any of the discrepancies identified in, in earlier reports uh, have been addressed. <clears throat> uh, also based on some uh, previous study uh, you know, an anticipated foundation settlement uh, of the new building's foundation could translate to the Merchant House uh, Museum's foundation and cause movement and, and cracks in the historic original plaster finishes and require, and, you know, which may require specialized repair to maintain that historic integrity. Uh, obviously a serious concern. Um, also just uh, vibration limits. Uh, information has not been provided to NYC Parks. Uh, uh, verifying that any concerns in the uh, previous uh, WJE report uh, regarding the ceasing of construction upon reaching that 0.2 inches per second vibration threshold. Uh, that, that information hasn't been shared yet. Uh, similarly, as a result, the potential for unobserved and unchecked damage to occur in adjacent structures, uh, that, that those concerns uh, has not yet been addressed. Um, information has similarly not been provided to NYC Parks regarding concerns in uh, earlier reports about the risk of damage to the House Museum as a result of uh, construction activities, uh, the methods of adjacent uh, excavation and members uh, measures for controlling erosion or specific requirements for monitoring movement of temporary retaining walls until that uh, foundation mat has been completed. Uh, and then uh, last, and then the sidewalk and roof protection measures, we uh, uh, additional information has not been yet provided uh, to NYC Parks about those concerns and early reports regarding requirements for sidewalk and roof protection to be addressed. So with respect to the new proposal, uh, I'll note, uh, or Commissioner uh, Hajibab notes, uh, the new proposal includes the option to bring the Merchant's House chimney flue into the new building to allow for extension of the flue to meet code requirements without impacting the landmark house. Uh, while such a strategy is available under the NYC fuel gas code, no information has been provided by the developer to NYC Parks regarding the design of this approach uh, or the impact of the house, uh, the Merchant's Museum, uh, nor has there been any discussion with, with the agency regarding any legal agreements that might be required by, by NYC Parks to execute uh, such a plan. So, uh, you know, without an understanding of how this and, and various other factors will be achieved, uh, we're, you know, we're NYC Parks is, is not able to really comment fully on this strategy as we, uh, you know, would certainly require uh, additional sufficient time to review materials in light of uh, our internal and, and external uh, requirements. Uh, so that's uh, our submission there from uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Haji Babich. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, Borough President uh, Gail Brewer. Okay, uh, Borough President, you just need to unmute yourself, turn your camera. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry about the technical issues. Um, I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I'm here to deliver a statement in opposition to the application for 27 East Gore Street. The location of this proposed development is a historic district, as you know, and as you know, adjacent to a beloved and fragile landmark uh, building and this Merchants House Museum. It's a singular exterior and interior landmark, and it's a rare example of an intact and fully preserved uh, 19th century home. It's 200 years old, and I think we know that any construction impacts resulting from the proposed development have to be carefully evaluated, as you heard from the Parks Department, especially as the museum building presents significant structural concern. They have open joints, they have cracks, they have water damage. And I certainly know this because they're always asking for capital money to fix them. And any construction vibrations at adjacent sites will lead to further damage, I believe, of the museum's Western facade. And as you heard earlier, we're concerned about the plaster. And we know in 2018, in September, the city council voted to disapprove an application for a rezoning of the site that would have, as you heard earlier, been an eight-story commercial building. Um, 
Now with community board two, we're concerned about the proposed demolition and construction of the building next door because of the issues I've outlined in terms of the structural damage and also the artifacts housed in the museum. The museum director has estimated they would cost about $5 million to secure the museum building, to store its contents, to compensate for lost revenue, and to carry on all the other functions as an organization which have to take place if this proposed construction were to take place. The applicant has provided drawings and testimony to safeguard, as you heard, the museum structure, but they didn't take into uh, any kind of a provision to secure the landmark interior of the house and its content. No proof has been provided that the house would not suffer damage during construction, again, as you heard, especially to the irreplaceable decorative plaster. This is a cherished institution, as you know, on the Lower East Side and even internationally. It needs to be there to preserve and honor the history of the area. So I urge the Landmarks Preservation Commission to deny this application so as to protect the Merchant's House Museum in this landmark building for generations to come. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, and next we have um, State Senator Hoyleman. Daddy, he's daddy. One minute, sorry. Daddy. Sorry. Uh, daddy. Yes. Daddy. Yes, your grandma. Good Daddy. afternoon. Daddy, my daddy. Yes. My grandmother didn't give it to me as needed. Oh yes, she has needed. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify today regarding the certificate of appropriateness uh, for the proposed hotel at 27 East Fourth Street, adjacent to the historic Merchants House Museum. I'm testifying on behalf of my colleague, Assembly Member. Deborah Glick and myself, State Senator Brad Hoyleman. Uh, we joined Community Board 2, Manhattan uh, Village Preservation, the Historic District Council, the Merchant's House Museum, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who we just heard, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, and neighborhood residents and other stakeholders in strongly opposing the current application. The proposed hotel would loom over other buildings on the block and also erode the character of the street and neighborhood. Construction of this hotel would not only be out of context with the surrounding area, but would threaten the adjacent Merchant's House Museum's very existence. Built in 1832, as, as many of us know, the Merchant's House Museum is a federal, state, and city landmark. The purpose, proposed hotel would be even larger than the developer's previously proposed structure that was ultimately rejected by the New York City Council. Conclusive engineering studies showed that construct even the smaller building would pose an existential threat to the merchant house's structural integrity and its landmarked interior. A larger structure could be even worse. Any damage caused by the applicant could result in temporary or permanent closure, stifled revenue, displaced staff and personnel, massive storage costs for the museum's priceless collections, and potentially destroy the museum altogether. We'd also like to point out that due to pending litigation of the developer's previous plan, we believe that this application to the LPC is premature. The applicant should wait until the legal matters are resolved before applying again. It is also clear to us that developers frequently submit proposals for structures that LPC or the City Council Land Use Committee are bound to object to in order to return with a smaller, more trimmed down proposal. In the past, we've even seen that the revised proposal represents, which looks like a compromise, was their preferred option all the while. We hope that the LPC can recognize that this tactic and consider objections to the previous application when considering this out of context structure. We respectfully urge you to reject this application and in so doing, protect the Merchant's House Museum from permanent harm that would be unavoidable if this project were to proceed. Thank you so much for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have Michael Hiller. Hello, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Michael Hiller, Hiller PC. We represent Merchants House and stand in opposition to the application for a C of A. As reflected in our written submission, the first inquiry on any application for a C of A is whether the granting of a, a certificate of appropriateness would advance or detract from the purposes of the landmarks law. If the work is contemplated is by the requested C of A would advance the purpose of the law, the commission is supposed to grant it. But if not, the application is supposed to be denied. And that's reflected in our written papers. The grant of a certificate of appropriateness here uh, would not advance any of the purposes of the landmarks law. As I expect, you will hear today from Justin Spivey of WJE Engineers, the composition of subsurface materials beneath the subject property, coupled with the mass of the new proposed building and the particular type of foundation supporting Merchant's House would render it vulnerable to structural compromise if the proposed building were to be built. Engineer Spivey, Spivey will also tell you that the foundation settlement and soil compression would drag Merchant's House downward, creating stress cracks and thus permanently damaging the original last of its kind 1832 plaster on each floor and ceiling of the Merchant's House. The applicant's design team has claimed a commitment to protect Merchant's House. However, engineer Spivey in his written materials has confirmed that he repeatedly raised dozens of engineering issues with this very applicant's design team over the last six years and the applicant's design team has not taken action to resolve them. Anyone who thinks that the applicant is going to look to Merchant's House uh, uh, to protect it, I remind the commission of what Mr. Rubenacre just said moments ago. He said, once they get the approval, quote, we will be off to the races. That is exactly what is going to happen here. Uh, and while, and I don't mean to pick on GMS, I don't believe that GMS is involved in this in providing a pre-construction pre survey or uh, adding vibration monitors is of any comfort to the merchant to the merchant's house. Fact is, recently GMS was, uh, and I say this with some trepidation because again, I don't want to pick on them. But GMS was sued after providing a pre-construction uh, pre survey and providing vibration monitors with the same limits that are provo proposed here, and was sued because the building next door became uninhabitable. They were supposed to protect that building, and they didn't. And in the defense of that case, they argued they had no obligation to the adjacent property owner. The name of the case is Seymour versus Hovnanian. Uh, I mentioned this to you again, not to pick on them, but to point out just how dangerous it is to have a, a, an adjacent construction, even with a sturdy building next door. And even if the applicant's design team had been responsive to Mr. Spivey's concerns, I'm saying it wouldn't matter. As reflected in our written submission and the expert reports attached to it, and as confirmed by the um, by city council in 2018, when it considered the applicant's prior proposal, this building with its increased massing cannot be built without permanently damaging the merchant's house and any damage would be irreversible. I'll just close with this last point because I know I'm running out of time. The, the applicant today emphasized to you that you previously granted a certificate of appropriateness for this property in 2018 based upon deliberations that began in 2013. But what's critical here is that at that time, the commission had been furnished with a sign off from the parks department engineer before that engineer actually was afforded the opportunity to review the geotechnical and structural engineering studies, which were undertaken to evaluate the subsurface material underlying this property. The reason that's important is that the city council did get that information as did Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, State Senator uh, Brad Hoyleman, and all the other public officials who stand in opposition to this application. I won't get into aesthetics because I don't have time. I will simply close with this following comment. Um, 55 years ago, city council had the good sense to recognize that the loss of architecturally and culturally significant properties threatens a loss of our collective identity as New Yorkers. We trust that the commission recognizes it well and will do everything in its power to preserve this merchant's house by rejecting the application. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Next we have Andrea Goldwyn, followed by John Krawcheck. Okay, thank you. Uh, good day, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. This proposal would require demolition of an existing 1945 garage in order to construct a new seven-story building. We do not oppose the loss of the garage, but we reiterate concerns we raised in 2012, the last time there was a proposal at this site, that this project has the potential to cause severe damage to the neighboring Merchant's House Museum. This concern is not theoretical. 
In 1988, the building to the immediate east was demolished, requiring a million dollars of structural repairs and interior restoration at the Merchant's House and closing it for over two years. The significance of the Merchant's House cannot be overstated. The commission recognized this when it designated the exterior on its own first day of existence in 1965 and then the interior in 1981. The interior designation report states that the old merchant's house is a unique document of its period, which shows with unrivaled authenticity how a prosperous New York City merchant and his family lived in the mid 19th century. It's a National Historic Landmark and a member of the Historic House Trust. The Building Envelope Foundation and the invaluable historic interior plaster will be at risk if this project moves forward. Therefore, both the owner and developer need to take all possible steps to minimize any risk. If you approve this application, certain steps must be taken before demolition can begin. The commission should devise a special protection plan written to the satisfaction of the Merchant's House Museum. The city and historic house trust must undertake an assessment of all existing conditions, especially at the west wall, which would abut the new building. The developer must ensure the stability of the house before construction begins, including any necessary treatments to the west wall. The proposal states that the developers will enact steps beyond DOB TPPN 1088 requirements for monitoring. All of the measures mentioned above must be memorialized in any permit with ongoing LPC review. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have John Krawchuk. Followed by Pi Gardner. Good afternoon, commissioners. And thank you for your time today. My name is John Krawchuk and I'm the executive director of the Historic House Trust. We wish to raise significant concerns regarding the scale, design, code compliancy, and essential protections for the Merchant's House that must be considered for any development of the property at 27 East 4th Street. I would like to note for the record that the applicant has not contacted NYC Parks, the Historic House Trust, or the museum regarding this design and essential coordination. We wish to note the following. Merchant's House has active chimney flues for exhausting mechanical systems in the basement of the house. The applicant without any coordination with the Merchant's House stakeholders has evidently proposed exhausting the chimneys internally through the new building. This may not be possible or feasible and will require extensive interventions in the fragile historic fabric of the house in order for the work to be code compliant. And I, by that, I mean the breaching that would be required to make the ventilation for the merchant's house code compliant would require a lot of demolition of the existing historic fabric in order to insert that into the house. We are opposed to any proposal that requires alteration at this scale. A more appropriately scaled building in keeping with the size of the merchant's house would eliminate this concern. I've included very specific code references and concerns in my testimony that was submitted um, for the record. The visual impact of proposed flu extensions has also not been studied or provided for public comment. The lot immediately east of the merchant's house will be developed as a publicly accessible open space and the required visibility studies have not been conducted with consideration for this public space, nor the garden of the merchant's house. Regarding the design, we have concerns related to the height, massing, and detailing. Any proposed building on this site should be designed with the least impact, not the maximum allowable limits, and should be in keeping with the scale of the merchant's house. Floor to ceiling heights should be reduced, the rear extension respectful of the setbacks of the merchant's house garden. The material choices for the facade should be more compatible with buildings on the block and the lot line windows should be eliminated. There continues to be an adequate information regarding how the applicant will protect the museum before and during construction. Monitoring alone is insufficient to protect and preserve the house. The Merchant's House as a landmark is special in nature due to its age and the high level of historic integrity. The entire structure, collections, and particularly the interior is a singular survivor and hallmark of the Greek revival domestic life from the 19th century. Its age and originality make it incredibly vulnerable to damage. 
by a proposed building of this magnitude. Should the proposal will suffer extreme hard required to close, staff vacate, and entire contents of the house will need to be carefully packed and, and archivally stored. This vibrant cultural institution will not be able to serve its mission for years to come, severely impacting its identity, restricting public access, and straining the museum's financial resources. In conclusion, the Historic House Trust implores the New York City Landmarks Commission to carefully consider this application and the potential impacts to the Merchant's House. The commission must ensure this irreplaceable landmark is safeguarded from damage and continues to thrive as a public house museum to serve generations to come. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, so next we have Pi Gardner, who I've just brought in, followed by um, Kelly Carroll. So, Pat Gardner, just please state your name for the record, and you have three minutes. Here I am. Um, good afternoon. I'm Pi Gardner, and it is my great fortune to be director of the Merchant's House for 30 years and counting. As a museum in the public domain, the Merchant's House is bound by its mission and the public trust to preserve and protect its original collection and 1832 landmark building, which is, as you all well know, Manhattan's first. If construction, God forbid, does move forward, here's what we will need to do before a single shovel can go in the ground. First, there's the packing, removal, and storage of the original Treadwell collection of 3,000 items, cost $1.8 million. Once the collection is off-site, we'll be able to try to reduce the inevitable damage to our landmark interior. As you also know well, there are only 120 of us and only six residences. We will erect padded scaffolding to secure and cushion the original plaster walls, ceilings, and decorative elements in each room on all four floors. That'll be a million dollars. We'll also need to undertake essential repairs to our fragile 189-year-old building. Repairs deemed hazardous and critical are estimated to cost 1.4 to 1.5 million, 350,000 for the west wall alone. Finally, with no collection and scaffolding in every room, we will be forced to close the museum to the public and rent temporary offices for the duration of the construction. That means lost revenue and rental expenses of $800,000. Total $5 million that we do not have. Let me end with a few zingers from the written testimony of Francis Moroni, who self describes as, and I quote, an architectural historian who has for the last 40 years been writing and lecturing about pre-Civil War American architecture. He says this about the Merchant's House, it is unique and it is uniquely important. It's not just unique in New York, but in the world. What makes it so is first of all, the extraordinary quality of the house. It is as fine a house as its era produced in New York. Nowhere else in New York or in America may the domestic city architecture of the era be so fruitfully studied from the magnificent wrought ironwork of the front railings to the servants' bedrooms. Almost finished. It's unique indeed, and the kicker here is that it's irreplaceable. All those highfalutin state-of-the-art monitors, they only track the damage after it has been done and it's lost. Yet here we are again, facing a new application for a building that is inappropriate in the historic district and taller and even more massive than the last go round. The risk of irreparable damage as predicted by many engineering studies to the merchant's house is even higher, too high. Is not this why we have a Landmarks Preservation Commission to preserve landmarks? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kelly Carroll, bringing you in, um, followed by Sarah Bean Appen. Okay. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. 
As the Historic Districts Council stated to the Landmarks Preservation Commission in 2012 and more recently to City Council in 2018, we would not say that development is impossible next to the museum, but any development here would need to be infinitely sensitive to the fragile Merchant's House Museum. It cannot be stressed enough that this public institution is wholly unique in our city as an essentially wholly intact 19th century residential interior. This is a historic structure which possesses nearly every kind of government protection there is up to being owned by the city of New York. If there ever were a time for the Landmarks Preservation Commission to apply the full weight of its real and implicit authority upon a building proposal for the purposes of fulfilling its essential mission of protecting those elements of our city's history for the health, prosperity, safety, and welfare of the people, it is now. This is a make or break situation for preservation in our city. If the merchant's house is at all damaged by this proposal, it will be an irreparable loss of a unique and precious artifact. This must be avoided, and if it cannot be, then this proposal must be denied. This is not the time for the LPC to be timid or hesitant with its oversight. Any cost to this public treasure would be too great, and New Yorkers are depending upon the LPC and its sister agencies to uphold the public trust and ensure the safety of the merchant's house. That being said, HDC's Public Review Committee closely examined the engineering drawings and we believe them to be carefully considered. They must be executed with extreme caution and painstaking vigilance. We further found the proposed design of the new building to be contextual with new construction in the NoHo Historic District. The building makes classical design gestures in a contemporary way and it is a tremendous improvement from the previous proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and Sarah Bean Atman, followed by um, Anne Haddad. Okay. Yep. Yes, we're ready. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Bean Atman, Village Preservation. It is nothing short of a miracle that the Merchant's House has survived intact on the interior and exterior for almost 200 years. The city, state, and nation have recognized the significance of this piece of history from the country's earliest days by designating an individual New York City landmark, an interior landmark, listing it on the New York State and National Register of, Registers of Historic Places and naming it a National Historic Landmark. While the applicant states that they plan to take precautions to ensure that the integrity of the merchant's house is maintained, all too often we see the best of intentions in this regard not live up to the promises and the cost has been the damage or loss of significant historic buildings. The proposed new building while shorter than what was previously proposed along the street wall actually has a larger footprint requiring more excavation and potentially more opportunity for damage to the merchant's house. We defer to the museum's experts who say that the planned precautions and safety measures are wholly inadequate to protect the house from substantial and lasting damage. This is a unique situation. This is not a private property owner being placed at risk, but a public institution and a national treasure. Even minor damage to the interior of the building would have a profound public impact and change the museum's ability to serve the public. New York has invested millions of dollars over the years in helping to maintain and restore the Merchant's House Museum, and no price tag can be placed upon the benefit which the public receives from it, what it has offered for close to 100 years. For these reasons, we strongly urge the Commission to deny this or any other application for work next door that could endanger one of the city's greatest and earliest historic landmarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next we have Anne Haddad. And as I'm, so Anne, I'm bringing you in now. And just a reminder to everybody, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. I'm still working off the sign-in sheet, but it's helpful if you raise your hand. And, and you should be ready to go. Just need to unmute yourself. Thank you. My name is Anne Haddad, and as the historian at the Merchant's House Museum, it is my duty to point out the historical narrative that would be lost to New York City forever should the developers, God forbid, be permitted to build next door 
which would necessitate the closing of the museum. The Merchant's House Museum is the last surviving historic home that is an authentic, tangible link to an important era in 19th century New York City. And that is the period between the formation of the New Republic and the Civil War when the powerful merchant class of which Seabury Treadwell was a member dominated social, economic, and political life and established the New York City that became and remains the nation's preeminent financial center. The Merchant's House Museum also reflects the story of the Treadwell family and New Yorkers of their time who witnessed our city's industrial growth, the social reform and suffrage movements, the evolution of fashion, the surge of immigration, the deadliness of epidemics, and the strife of the Civil War. And most importantly, the Merchant's House Museum is the only vestige of the lives of the struggling Irish immigrant servants who worked for the wealthy elite. Through our collections, tours, exhibitions, blog, public programming, and through our costume conservation, those who seek to learn from our collective past are permitted to hear these rich and compelling stories through the lens of those who lived and worked at the house, as well as the history of the neighborhood that was New York City's first exclusive suburb. Closing the museum, a horrible and inevitable consequence of the proposed construction would deny them that privilege and rob them of an understanding of New York City's and for that matter, the nation's history. I respectfully urge the LPC to do its rightful duty by this beloved landmark and by New York City history, to respect the work of preservationists who have gone before them and to reject the new application for development. If I may borrow a directive from Dr. Joseph Warren, a hero of the American Revolution, I say to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, act worthy of yourselves. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Dale Vandersand, followed by Lynn Funk. Okay, Dale, you just need to unmute yourself, turn on your camera. I don't see that you see my face there, but I am, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Okay. Uh, I am Dale Vandersand, a volunteer at the Merchant's House Museum for the last 22 years. I oppose the proposal for the building at the 27 East 4th Street site, echoing the concern for the survival of the Merchant's House. I have two particular reasons to add to what has already been said. First, it is folly to believe that the 1832 building of the museum will not suffer irreversible damage to its precious plasterwork, walls, and adjacent marble fireplaces, if not destroy the building altogether, something we have seen happen in the East Village before. A few years ago, I arrived at the museum to attend a programming meeting when NYU was doing construction at the old Tower Records building on Broadway and East 4th, a good three building lots away and across the street. While sitting in the third floor meeting room of the museum, I had thought there were earthquake tremors until I realized that the directors who worked there daily were not reacting, being used to the effects of that construction. Were that work being done next door, there would be no way that those tremors would not crack and crumble the building. Secondly, I wish to bring to mind the importance of the Merchant's House Museum as a cultural institution. <laughs> we are the envy of house museums for the diversity and creativity of our programming, our dedicated and close knit volunteer core and for its international visitorship. I've been the director of a classical vocal arts group in residence there for the past 17 years. And one of our charges had been to raise funds to help renovate the beautiful Rosewood 1848 piano forte purchased by the Treadwell family, which remains in situ for the last 173 years. Stuart Pollock of the Metropolitan Museum restored the instrument, which has a surprisingly delicate parchment and wire mechanism, which, had, which was so intact that although the instrument itself is not especially unique, it has become a pristine document of its type. This parallels the story of the Merchant's House itself, whose importance is that it is a typical example of its place and time, a precious and delicate document of the past, and the only remaining such structure intact. 
its destruction effectively and needless, needlessly erases this significant history and enriching cultural in establishment from our midst. We have been fighting for our survival here for nine years now and disappointed time and again by the LPC's decisions in the past. I urge you to be heroes, not zeros, at this critical juncture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Lynn Funk. And Lynn, you just need to unmute yourself and show on your camera. Lynn will be followed by Teresa Dutheroff. Hey, Lynn, I sent you a request to unmute yourself. Lynn Funk, you just unmute yourself. Okay, I don't think you're here. Um, so I'm gonna change you back. And we're going to go on to uh, Teresa Lutherot. Okay, Teresa, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you. I'm Teresa Utherald, and as a friend and neighbor of the Merchant's House, I urge you to deny this application. This is not just another office building proposal. This lot matters because of its neighbor, the only remaining intact row house from this period, the only one. The Merchant's House stands while none of its peers remain, because whenever it faced grave danger, someone had the courage, character, and foresight to step up and defend its existence. When the last Treadwell passed in 1930, despite the hardship of the Great Depression, George Chapman saved the house from auction and transformed it into a public museum, personally underwriting its expenses for 25 years so New Yorkers could enjoy it. In the 1960s, when the house fell into disrepair, once the Chapman funds were de depleted and its demolition seemed inevitable, the great Ada Louise Huxtable championed its survival Thanks to her tireless advocacy, this very commission granted its first landmark designation to the Merchant's House in its inaugural meeting in 1965, which was supposed to protect the house from all future threats forever. George Chapman and Ada Louise Huxtable saved the Merchant's House during its darkest hours. Will you be there for the Merchant's House now? It is the public's expectation that your greatest purpose is to protect our landmarks and our historic districts, to abdicate in favor of more office space at a time of record vacancies when thoughtful people debate the future of our existing office buildings would be a betrayal to the community. I can only imagine their outrage when the merchant's house is irreplaceably damaged. I have read all the engineering reports prepared by nationally renowned firms with no financial interest in this project. Irreversible damage from construction is inevitable and no amount of monitoring can save the house's plaster once it suffered vibrations from demolition. To argue that this project can proceed safely with proper oversight is to engage in magical thinking akin to climate change denial. Fortunately, there are many excellent reasons to deny this application and you will hear many fine arguments today about appropriateness and massive height and bulk of the building and how it will destroy the merchant's house context forever. Above all, if the merchant's house collapses, I ask you, forever altering the streetscape on East 4th Street, how could this project meet the bar for appropriateness in a historic district? Fortunately, this story can have a happy ending with your leadership. The application should be denied and such denial would present no harm to the developer as the air rights at 27 East 4th Street can be transferred to the developer's contiguous lot at 403 Lafayette, he can enjoy the full benefits of developing his property without harming the public good. This application is unnecessary, dangerous, and inappropriate, 
and I urge you to reject it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Patrick Ciccone, followed by um, Chandra Metzler. Patrick, you can turn on your camera if you choose, but otherwise you are ready. I'm here. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick W. Ciccone, and I'm the co-author of Bricks and Brownstone, The New York Row House. I am speaking to urge the Landmarks Preservation Commission to vote no to the Certificate of Appropriateness application for 27 East, East 4th Street due to the potential catastrophic effect on its neighbor to the east, the Merchant's House building. The Merchant's House is New York's most significant row house and arguably its landmark richest in historic value. It is also critical to the history of historic preservation in New York. The building has been operated as a museum continuously since the 1930s and was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1966, the only row house in Manhattan not associated with a famous historical figure or event to hold this honor. It was, remember, as others have said, the very first building designated a New York City landmark, and its interior was designated a city landmark in 1981. This proposal forces the Landmarks Preservation Commission to affirm, or rather reaffirm, that its primary civic responsibility is the protection of historic buildings, not the regulation of new construction. Here, I believe that the true, only true and appropriate historic context for the design is its potential effect on the integrity of the Merchant's House building. Put simply, approval of this design would place the Merchant's House building in mortal danger as a construction project could result in the house's structural failure and collapse. I have provided as visual testimony, photographs shot for the new edition of Bricks and Brownstone. I urge the commissioners to reacquaint themselves these beautiful yet fragile interiors, especially the fine plaster work. There is no more intact vessel of an otherwise lost 19th century New York City. All of what you see is threatened by construction vibration. As this extremely delicate plaster work may be shaken off the walls and ceilings and destroyed. Though the current design proposes construction period monitoring for cracks and vibrations, the very fragility of the merchant's house building makes it a pledge to monitor a sword of Damocles. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to live in a New York where every cultural institution, landmark or not, has faced possible obliteration, and the Merchant's House Museum has not been spared from this threat. During the past year, the cancellation of in-person programs for public health reasons and the museum's limited capacity to safely admit visitors after reopening have strained the museum's already lean resources. The size and intensity of the project proposed next door, as, 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 this, as Pai has eloquently stated, will close the museum for month, for years, relocate, force them to relocate its collection and attempt, force them to attempt to stabilize the building at its own cost, if it survives at all. Let us not mourn the needless premeditated destruction of the Merchant's House. The Landmarks Preservation Commission must vote no to this proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So next is uh, Chandra Metzler, followed by David Mulkins. Hi, sorry for the... Hi. Can you hear and see me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Um, please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Sure. Uh, this is Chandra Metzler, and I am dialing in to voice opposition to the plans to develop 27 East 4th Street, like so many others that I've spoken up today. And I have submitted written testimony already, so I won't be repetitive of that. Um, what I do want to add to my written testimony is having listened to the developers um, for the site speak earlier today, um, I, it, it added to my concern. And, and here's why. Because we have oodles of people on this call who are speaking up to, to talk about how special the Merchant's House is. And the developers claim to really care about preserving it. And yet I heard the term reasonable used over and over again in describing uh, the measures they would take to protect the merchant's house. And I think given the specialness of the merchant's house, I don't wanna hear reasonableness. <laughs> what I wanna hear is going above and beyond. I wanna hear that they're taking extraordinary care. I wanna hear that they are um, doing everything within their power, not just reasonable. And I think I heard the term reasonable six times and that's with my um, cell phone service cutting in and out. So 
Um, I'll conclude my remarks here because um, most of what my sentiment has been repeated by others and in my written testimony, but I just want to add that I thought the presentation today by the, just the developers was even more disturbing to me, just given um, uh, what I consider to be a careless attitude towards this very special, special place in the Merchant's House. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Dave, David Mulkins, followed by uh, Giorgio Bovenzi. David, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Yes. Okay. So David, please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Okay. Building a 113 foot office tower next door to the four story Merchant House Museum would have a catastrophic impact on the structural survival of this storied but fragile, irreplaceable New York City landmark. Built in 1832 with a late federal style exterior and a Greek revival interior, it's the city's only 19th century family home preserved intact, both inside and out. On a personal note, as a 25 year public high school history teacher, I ask you to recognize that unlike mere facades, which we observe much like a painting on a wall, the Merchant's House Museum is for students of history, a profoundly meaningful 3D experience, allowing us to walk in the shoes of the people who lived, worked, laughed, loved, and died there. It's a piece of the city's commercial history, as well as a narrative of middle-class life, the lives of women, and the lives of the Irish immigrant servants. In addition to endangering one of NoHo historic district's oldest and most unique structures, the proposed development would tower over the four-story Merchant's House Museum violate its historic sense of place and take away light from its charming backyard garden. The Merchant's House Museum previously suffered severe damage from the demolition of 31 East 4th Street and the subsequent below the surface drilling for the aquifer that's located there. Structural and geotechnical engineers have testified that this fragile structure could not survive if that tower is built. Open to the public since 1936, the 186-year-old Merchant's House Museum is a vital, irreplaceable New York City treasure that deserves to be protected. Please reject the developer's application for 27 East 4th Street. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Giorgio Bovenze, or Bovenze, excuse me, and followed by Nick Nicholson. Okay, Giorgio, please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. I should be unmuted, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Please okay. start. I don't see the video, but should I start without the video? Yes, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Giorgio Bovenzi and a member of the East 4th Street Association. My testimony is in opposition to the proposed project at 27 East 4th Street. The proposed building is inappropriate for lots of reasons, but mainly because it puts the merchant's house at high risk of collapse and certain risk of irreparable damage. It's that simple. And this is the real issue before this commission. The proposal mimics a prior proposal by the same owner, but with one important difference. This one is substantially larger in volume and mass than the prior one that was rejected by the city council because of the risk it created for the merchant's house. Today's proposed building is more than one third bigger in footprint and mass than the prior proposal. 
Slide 17 shows that. It defies common sense to think that this larger building can be built safely and without even more concerning issues. I have read the structural and geotechnical engineering reports that were prepared by the Merchants House highly respected engineering firms. They concluded that no monitoring can be effective to prevent damage. They explain in painful details that this landmark would certainly suffer damage to its exterior and its interior and will likely collapse. This is a fact. The merchant's house would sustain irreparable damage and would likely collapse if the building is built next to it. Even the developer's own engineers admitted no long ago that damage to the merchant's house is possible. These were defects that convinced the city council to deny the developer's application, application in 2018. These facts are even more striking now in the face of a larger building like the one discussed today. As Mr. Hiller noted, when this commission issued the certificate for the prior proposal, the geotechnical studies were still being developed. I was there. That evidence was later on finalized and presented to city council, which said, no way can we allow this construction. That evidence provides today this commission with a different, more accurate picture of the risk created by any construction taking place next to the merchant's house. A new construction that carries the risk of such destruction for the merchant's house cannot be appropriate. Monitoring and protection programs are a fallacy when it comes to the merchant's house. Make no mistake, this is a zero sum game. Either you allow the merchants, the, the new building and either you allow the new building and forfeit the merchant's house or you deny the application and save the merchant's house for our pos pos posterity. One final point, the owner purchased 27 East Fort along with the more important 403 Lafayette building. This happened decades after the merchant's house had become the first landmark. And thus when the property rights on the 27 East Fort lot were already compressed and limited by its vicinity to such an important landmark. Fast forward to today, the owner wants to also develop 403 Lafayette and Councilwoman Rivera has publicly stated she will give her political support to the transfer of air rights from 2070 Sports to 403 Lafayette and make it happen in order to save the merchant's house. This will be a win-win for the owner. And this is an additional reason why it makes sense to reject this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have Nick Nicholson, followed by Michael Rayhill. And I'd like to remind people to please keep your um, comments to three minutes. We have a lot of speakers still ready to speak. So Nick Nicholson, I've brought you in. Yeah, unmute yourself. There you go. Am I unmuted? <clears throat> yeah, you're yeah. ready. Please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. My name is Nick Nicholson, and since 2006, I have been honored to serve as the chair of the board of directors of the Merchants House Museum. And I have to say, in the past 15 years, nine of which have been spent in opposition to this careless project, I have never seen such a clear and present danger to the safety of New York City's only remaining 19th century townhouse inside and out. The house is a unique and original historic document of life in New York City from the pre-Civil War period, all of the plaster work, all of the furnishings, and the collections of decorative arts were selected by the family who lived in the house for a hundred years. There is no other house in New York which is so capable of showing what life in the 19th century was like. And it is for this reason, as everyone has noted, the merchant's house is both an interior and an exterior landmark. I have to say sort of impromptu because again, I have also submitted written testimony and many of my colleagues and friends at the Merchant's House have said things that I was planning on saying. I simply have to reiterate to the Landmarks Preservation Commission that as we sit here, you are in a lawsuit with the developers for their previous application. They have two applications in at the same time. Their desire to build this building and damage ours is so difficult to watch. It is really hard to sit in this and listen to everyone once again come to the defense of this historic building. As a curator and as a former specialist in decorative arts, both at Christie's and at Freeman's in Philadelphia, I can only stress to you, do you know how long it takes to take apart a pair of mid 19th century gasoliers that are historic to put them into storage? I do, it took two and a half weeks for specialists from the Metropolitan Museum to come and do that 10 years ago. Do you know how long it takes to detach a 19th century gilt wood pier mirror from the wall? It took a team of eight people and two days to take it down and put it back. 
Do you know what it takes to disassemble an entire Duncan Fife dining room set and move it into storage? I've done it at Christie's. And in the auction house world, we say three moves is worse than a fire. To pack up the 3,000 objects in this collection, move them out of the merchant's house to storage, unpack them to do condition reports on them, let them sit in storage for a year, two years, three years, condition report them again, pack them up, move them back. It is an indescribable amount of infinitesimal damage to a collection that cannot be recreated and could not exist anywhere else but in the confines of this historic building. I strongly urge you to reject this. You are the only people who can do it. There is no way to recreate this. This is the last chance for this museum. Do you really want your legacy as commissioners to be that the merchant's house collapsed on your watch? I can't imagine that that's the case. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next, Michael Rayhill, followed by um, Kelsey Brow, King Manor. Okay, Michael Rayhill, please just unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Okay, um, good afternoon. Uh, dear commissioners, my name is Michael W. Rayhill and I'm speaking to you on a matter of the utmost urgency regarding the threat of irreversible damage occasioned by the proposed commercial building next to the historic Merchants House Museum in East 4th Street. There is no way to qualify the construction of a taller and much larger hotel adjacent to the most exquisitely preserved historic treasure in Manhattan and the guaranteed destruction it would inflict on this publicly owned exterior and interior landmarked house museum of city, state, and federal importance. The Merchant's House Museum is the keystone to understanding the nuanced and complex interdependent histories contained within this neighborhood, whose Pelham's test of history includes Lenape stewardship, Dutch ownership, the land grants of free Africans, the Herring and Stuyvesant Farms, the Treadwell family, and now the citizens of New York. Creating a pathway for an irresponsible development such as this would be a wantonly negligent transgression against what remains of New York's historic landscape. It is one thing to evaluate the opposition of a proposed structure adjacent to a historic building based on a vague assumption. It's quite another to evaluate the, the development based on well-documented material damages to the House Museum that occurred with the destruction of the adjacent townhouse of 27 East 4th Street in the late 1940s and building of the current garage, as well as the removal of 31 through 35 East 4th Street in the late 1980s. The very creation of the, the house of this house museum sprang up out of the need for self-preservation in the face of Gertrude Treadwell's niece, Lily Nichols' attempt to sell and auction off the invaluable contents of the house. The Merchant's House has been a house museum for the public since 1936. It is an institution. It was one of the first nine buildings to be simultaneously landmarked in New York. This early inclusion illustrates the strong sense of urgency that grew to meet the historic importance of the structure back in 1965. This importance has only been amplified over the years, but this increased profile has also grown the dangers that you as a commission are tasked with mitigating, whose very institution sprang up as a response to the shameful desecration of Pennsylvania St Station and the specter of runaway development. Please realize that the loss of value posed by a threat to the integrity of this building is incalculable, just like the supposed assurances of protection for the museum during the construction and proposed hotel of the developer are also incalculable. The only guarantee to safeguard the merchant's house is to issue a moratorium of development for 27 East 4th Street and to make clear to the, the, the developer that this is a larger than his property. It's about accounting for untold, uncompensated public costs that will never be recouped should this proceed. Please don't let the fox move next door to the hen house. Given this integral pu public function, I, I implore each and every one of you to please follow the community board's recommendation to not approve the developer's application for a hotel. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have King Manor to be followed by Philip S. Block. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, you're ready. Please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Kelsey Bro, and I'm the executive director of the King Manor Museum in Jamaica, Queens. As you know, Jamaica is targeted for development in the city's cultural plan. So conversations about balancing historic preservation and needed growth are near and dear to my heart. In an underdeveloped neighborhood like mine, we have the opportunity to build a type of neighborhood that promotes community equity, accessibility, health and sustainability that was unavailable to our friends in many areas of lower Manhattan. 
areas that were allowed to be developed without thoughtful planning and without oversight for reckless developers who cared more about profit than about our New York values. Our friends at the Merchant's House would not be in this predicament had these values been considered many decades ago. As mentioned previously, the Merchant's House was never meant to be a freestanding structure, but the unchecked demolition of its neighboring townhouses means that while it lives on, it does so in a precarious state, lacking the support of the houses to which it was once attached. While the Merchant's House Museum now lacks its adjacent sister houses for structural support, King Manor Museum is here to show moral support for our sister site. Historic sites like the one I am honored to represent and our friends and colleagues at the Merchant's House Museum are integral parts of the fabric of this great city. When we step into a historic building, we understand how the architecture was shaped by the social mores of the time, and in turn, how these social mores were reinforced by the very architecture of a building itself. This type of historical understanding is ever more valuable as we look to ensuring a, a green and equitable future city for generations to come. How can we encode our New York values into the architecture and urban design of the city without understanding of how the architecture of the past embodies the values of those times? The Merchant's House Museum is especially crucial for the valuable insights it provides. It encapsulates a time in which urban populations were beginning to overtake rural and shows how this area was becoming characterized by commerce and tenements rather than by single family homes and marked by the ongoing struggle for affordable housing, which the proposed development, by the way, does nothing to address. The parallels and lessons for thinking about urban planning today compared with the Merchant's House Museum's time are evident. Clearly, the Merchant's House helps us understand the past to create a better future, one in which the proposed development next door has no part. In 1841, New York Express published a description of New York in comparison with how the city looked in 1800. Exchanging farmland for city hall and beautiful buildings in which historical figures once lived for characterless banks and office buildings, the writer laments that hardly an old building remains and not one that is not so altered as to be totally different from what it was then. 180 years later, have we learned our lesson? Landmarks Committee, please reject the proposed development next to the Merchant's House Museum. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Phil Block. To be followed by Judith Ivory. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, please just state your name for the record, and you have three minutes. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Philip Block, and I've been part of the East 4th Street community for more than 25 years. Over those two plus decades, I've seen the neighborhood transform in so many positive ways. Unfortunately, the construction of the proposed large building on the site of 27 East 4th Street adjacent to the old merchant's house is not one of them. Given the fragility of that historic building and its landmark status, both outside and within, it is imperative that we, as custodians of the neighborhood, exercise the utmost scrutiny when considering the construction of this adjacent lot. In proposal and plan, little has changed from the developer's original presentation of the engineering considerations even though this new proposed building is considerably larger in height and mass than the first building. There is no guarantee that the surprisingly fragile rubble foundation and building structure of the old merchant's, old merchant's house will not be undermined and damaged during construction. The variety of safeguards that will be used will only signal the distress when it is too late. There will be no turning back. The risk is too great the harm too severe. The character of a neighborhood rests firmly on the needs and the desires of a community. There's little need in our community for a building of this type and no desire to have this join our street, streetscape. Like so much in life, just because one can does not mean one should. Here I argue this building should not be built. I believe the community and the developer can come together to explore a variety of options for the 27 East 4th Street site and work to build a plan and project that honors the history of the neighborhood, respects the integrity of the historic Merchant's House site and maximizes the opportunity this enterprise presents. 
as Jane Jacobs so presciently said, we expect too much of our new buildings and too little of ourselves. There is no new world you make without the old world. I implore you not to approve the plan currently in hand to build on this site. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Next we have Judith Ivory followed by Alice Hansberger. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name's Judith Ivory. And before I uh, read my prepared statement, I just want to say that I'm so impressed by all the testimonies that we've heard so far. I feel like I've had this great education. And so I just had to mention that. I am writing to protest the proposed commercial building at 27 East 4th Street. I've lived in this neighborhood now for over 30 years and have seen many changes in that time. And though I'm not opposed to change in our neighborhood and many of the changes over the years have been for the better, this project to me spells potential disaster. The old Merchant's House Museum is a crown jewel in our city, not just in our neighborhood. It's our duty as New Yorkers to be its guardian and assure its well-being. I've heard the developers defense of their project and the safeguards they plan to employ to supposedly protect the house, which seems at best to simply alert them if there is danger to the museum. It is simply not worth taking that chance. If danger is done, we will all have lost a beautiful and historic treasure. There's no second chance. Though it's been stated before earlier today, I think it's worth restating that I remind you that in 1965, the Landmarks Preservation Commission at its initial meeting granted the Merchant's House landmark designation. Please don't turn your back on your original principles. And one last thought, given the many paranormal experiences that have occurred over the years in the old Merchant's House, I don't think it would be a good idea to upset the spirits that live within. Thank you for your time. Lisa, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, Alice Hunsberger, um, I've brought you in already and you're gonna be followed by Ellie Hughes. So Alice, please just unmute yourself. There you go. Hello, uh, let me try and put the camera on. Uh, we can hear you if you want to continue. Okay. okay. My name is Alice Hunsberger, and today, in the company of all these experts, I represent myself and perhaps the general public. Uh, as a graduate of Tottenville High School in Staten Island and Upper West Sider for over 50 years, a history professor, an author, and a 30 year career fundraiser for New York City cultural institutions, I care deeply about the historical legacy of our city. I am also a licensed New York City tour guide explaining our changing neighborhoods and a member of GANIC and giving municipal art society tours uh, on, for Jane's walks. I oppose the proposed development adjacent to the Merchant's House Museum. As many people have said today, multiple engineering studies show that such development would um, cause catastrophic and irreparable damage to the 200, nearly 200 year old building. Jackhammering and months of construction would shake loose the original plaster and the nails, the material, the stuff of which the house is made. This precious treasure is unique as New York City's only family home preserved intact inside and out, which the LPC made sure to shelter in its very first 1965 list of landmark buildings. And then again, to underline its concern by landmarking the interiors in 1981. Such strong landmarking by the commission shows that the Treadwell family home is not just important architecturally, but it as preserved as a coherent original. Together, the interiors and exteriors are critical to our understanding of New York City's cultural, social, economic, and political life. The law states that it is a public necessity to protect and enhance improvements which reflect these multi layers of our city's history. The proposed building is not such an improvement, but in fact a clear danger 
to the Merchant's House Museum structurally and financially. We need another solution. And I, but at this moment, I urge the LPC to reject this application for construction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Ellie Hughes, followed by Deanna Wallach. Okay, hi. I don't know if you can hear slash see me. Um, it's like 10 o'clock at home, so I'm not entirely sure what yeah, I'm doing. We can hear you. Right. Please just start. Please just state your name for the record. Okay, cool. Hi, my name's Ellie Hughes. I am English, so it's, you know, a long thing. Um, basically, the reason I want to be part of this discussion today is that I had the very, very, very great fortune to visit the Merchant's House as a tourist last year with, uh, with a really good friend of mine. And... As someone who is like very new to the culture and you know hasn't seen a huge amount of the history in situ, it was the most incredible thing I saw in either of my two weeks that I've spent in New York. The like the history, the knowledge of the people running the site as well, and just like everything around it was absolutely incredible. The atmosphere, like the artifacts, the fact that you can go and see something that's, you know, over, like hundreds of years old and is exactly how it was back in the day, which is something that, you know, as as a Brit, I kind of take for granted because we just have that knocking about at home. But um, but in the US, it's such a rarity and it was such a privilege to be able to see that kind of thing that I feel if it was taken away and if there was any damage caused to the building by the construction, that would be to the significant detriment of the neighborhood and also for, you know, the cultural mores of the area. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have uh, Deanna Wallach. Okay, Deanna. Hi there. Uh, I'm. Hi. I'm. This is Deanna Wallach. I'm calling in to represent myself, um, and also many friends and family who have uh, grown up in New York, grown up around the Merchants House Museum, and uh, am. I'm personally incredibly troubled by the idea that this developer has simultaneously filed two lawsuits to build, uh, you know, what is comparatively going to be a, an insignificant possible source of hotel housing in a neighborhood that is already rife with hotels, as well as alternate sites for uh, guests and visitors of the area to use. I feel like there's no reasonable way that the developer could argue there would be uh, minimal damage, especially to the interior of the building. I'm, I'm really honored to have been a part of the group that's standing up in opposition to the movement. And I'd just like to say that I think any damage to the Merchants House Museum will obviously be irreparable and it's it's simply not worth the the preservation commission's time to to weigh the you know relatively minimal benefits of what the developer would attempt to build here versus what we'll lose if we lose the museum thank you okay thank you um i'd like to remind people that if you want to speak even if you're on the sign-in sheet will you please um raise your hand um Next, we'll go to Helena Kubica de Berganza. And to be led by Sandra Falcon. And again, please raise your hand if you would like to speak. Hello? Yes, please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Yeah, hi. Um, this is Helena Kubitska de Berganza. Sorry, I missed, I think I missed my call before. Uh, I am in strong opposition of the building that's being that the developer wants to build next door. Sorry, I'm just I have two kids, members of the merchant's house. Um sorry. Um and we feel strongly feel that we are 
We are strongly opposed to the, uh, the development. Hold, I'm sorry, I'm just looking up um, my testimony. I have two kids, so I've just been running around. Hold on one second, sorry. Um, okay. Actually, can you just skip me for a second so I can pull it up? I just re got home, so I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But, uh, okay. okay, here, I, I've got it. I've got it. Okay, I'm, I'm a member of the East 4th Street Block Association and would like to share my testimony in strong opposition to the development on uh, 27 East 4th Street. I'm a mother of two young children and we are members of the Merchant's House. When we visited the Merchant's House for the first time, we walked back in time into the early 1800s. My children's eyes were wide open with curiosity and enchantment while walking through every room and experiencing what daily life was like for a merchant's family living in New York City in the early 19th century. There is no other building that is currently standing in the city that offers this invaluable experience and education for our younger generations and visitors worldwide. By allowing this unwanted and unnecessary building to be developed, we are most certainly complicit in allowing to, for the demise of the merchant's house. Last month, a fire destroyed the historic 128 year old middle collegiate church, which was devastating for the community and also served as a women's shelter. Perhaps the fire could not be thwarted, but preventing the collapse of the merchant's house is possible. It is unjust and immoral to build anything next to a historic, delicate landmark building, which is a gem in our city. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, uh, Sandra Falcon, followed by um, Beth, Jeff Sapko. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Please state your name for the record. You okay. Can Hello, my name is Sandra Falcon. Um, I am here speaking on my own behalf as a lay person who nevertheless shares a profound love and concern for the unassuming national treasure that is the Merchant's House Museum. This commission has the moral obligation to deny any proposal to erect a building in the lot adjacent to 27, number 27 East 4th Street that could compromise either the structural integrity of the home or the museum's ability to stay in continuous operation and serve the city, the country, and indeed the world with its invaluable histories and legacy. This newly proposed project threatens the museum on both fronts and the loss implicated could be devastating and would be irreversible. The first time I visited Merchant's house, I set foot inside the foyer, the sounds of the city faded away behind me, and I knew I was in a place that would change my life. In fact, it did. That was the day I decided I wanted the first book I ever wrote, aside from my doctoral dissertation, to be about the Merchant's house. I spent the next few years writing my historical novel, which imagines what Gertrude Tre Treadwell's life might have been like in the years immediately following the death of her last sister. The journey of researching and weaving this unpublished story has been the most transformative creative experience of my entire life. I have since visited the Merchant's House more times than I can count. And here are some of the things that invariably happen every time I visit. Aside from the friendly, outstanding staff that routinely welcomes me with, is this your first time visiting us? Or a, you look familiar. Would you like to become one of our museum volunteers? What I hear from visitors, and this has happened without exception every time, is what a gem of a place this is. There's no place in New York like this. How fascinating. How did I not know this place was here? I can't wait to tell more people about it. And over and over and over again, from local folks as well as visitors from all over the country and various international backgrounds as we've already seen today. Sometimes I just sit and wait for it and it always comes. The comments, the marvel, the awe. Um, I love knowing that the Merchant's House Museum's unparalleled power to captivate the curiosity and imagination of its visitors hasn't been unique to me, but is shared by countless others who see it for the true historical treasure that it is. Uh, obviously, there are plenty of examples of long gone historical buildings and any loss of such a building is lamentable. Um, sorry, real quick. The house at East 27th Street at 27 East 4th Street does not tell a story of grandeur the way many other long gone buildings might have had they not been sacrificed for projects funded by large scale developers. It is not technically an imminent danger of an actual planned demolition. 
However, the museum stands for a different kind of story, which is no less at the heart of New York City and US history. It tells a story of the passage of time, of a loss, of loss of a family, of attempting to keep up with change, of loneliness, but also of the extraordinary persistence of the youngest daughter, who was the home's first lone steadfast preservationist to the tune of being labeled an eccentric in the final years of her life and even well after her death. It's poignant. I'm sorry, you're three minutes to pass. Could you please wrap up? Yes. Um, I asked that the commission please abide by their mission and denied this building proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Beth, followed by John Kevin Jones. Okay. Beth, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Okay, Beth, if you're here, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, Beth Sopko, last request to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm gonna move you back as an attendee. So next we have uh, Kevin Jones followed by Anthony Belov. So Kevin Jones bringing you in now. So just unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you choose. Hmm. My, you just need to state your name for the record. You have three minutes. I'm John Kevin Jones. I'm the executive director of Summoners Ensemble Theater, and we produce a Christmas Carol at the Merchant's House uh, every year. I'm also a Harlem resident. Um, Summoners is a nonprofit theater company. We're committed to working with other nonprofits like the Merchant's House to raise funding and participation through our work as performing artists. We are an artist-driven company, and we produce a Christmas Carol at the Merchant's House and the Merchant's House is an equal partner in our productions. I'm also the performer in the show. Uh, we captured lightning in a bottle with a Christmas Carol at the Merchant's House, and we're now a New York tradition with this story of transformation rooted in the past, looking squarely at the present, and with a kinder eye toward the future, which seems fitting for today, and is a perfect fit for the Merchant's House. Over the years, I've discovered the Merchant's House is far more than a museum, although that would be enough. It is an arts and cultural center for its neighborhood, city, and beyond. People all over the country and all over the world connect with the Merchant's House. I have watched them as they are awed and transported back in time by the intricate moldings and the decorative arts in the gorgeous Greek Revival double parlor. It's also uh, it's so affecting that about a third of our audience when we are able to perform live is made up of return patrons, some from as far away as the United Kingdom and the BBC World of News, in fact, uh, mentioned us this year uh, on our 2020 free live stream production of A Christmas Carol at the Merchant's House, calling us New York's hottest ticket. Uh, the Merchant's House was celebrating the holidays in over 2,500 homes this past holiday season. The Merchant's House is importance is not only as a landmark, but as a living place, a unique and bespoke experience right here in our own city. And if the Merchant's House is damaged, I think it's been shown pretty clearly tonight, it's a done deal. There's no going back. And the stories that the Merchant's House has yet to tell will be lost to time. And those stories are told with every visitor that walks into the house. It's the opportunity for an old story to be revived and a new story to be created. So I'm asking you to please ensure the future of the Merchant's House Museum intact as it is today and say no to the construction at 27 East 4th Street and I thank you for uh, listening to my remarks today. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Next we have Bob, followed by Susan Matheson. I need to uh, okay. okay. Yes, am I live? Yes, please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. I'm Anthony Belov, here to voice my opposition to the proposed building at 27 East 4th Street 
adjacent to the Merchant's House Museum. I'm speaking today not as a board member of that museum, but as a native New Yorker, deeply committed to my hometown. Through the years, I've shared the Merchant's House with tens of thousands of people worldwide. I first visited the old Merchant's House as an architecture student at Pratt Institute. I was overwhelmed by the power of the place, not a restoration or a reconstruction, a survivor. In Ada Louise Huxtable's words, the real thing. I became a volunteer that day and have remained one for almost 40 years. I'm committed to the survival, health, and growth of this important and unique resource, unique in the truest sense of the word, because it speaks, it teaches our school children, architects, socio-anthropologists, historians, New York City buffs, the curious, the tourists, the passerby. This place is unforgettable, life-changing. The house speaks loudly and eloquently of an otherwise vanished New York, the foundation of the city we live in today. It will continue to speak well into the future if you protect and preserve it by fulfilling your public trust. Does anyone not standing to profit from this project truly believe this significant landmark can survive aggressive excavation and construction right next door? I dread the first weeks of demolition. The bricks of the existing structure at 27 East 4th being jackhammered into dust, the original foundations of the 1831 Warner House torn to pieces, scaffolding suspended above the museum, the backhoes and excavators tugging at the very roots of this fragile building just inches from the tearing, vibrating machinery. And then the inevitable, the magnificent plaster work of the parlors breaks loose and crashes to the floor below. Cracks open in the west wall of the merchant's house, that wall slowly tottering and falling into the gaping hole next to it, dragging along the marble mantles from Italy and Sing Sing, the structural lumber from Georgia, the slate from Vermont and the bricks from Haverstraw, all in a devastated heap. This is not conjecture. I know this will happen. I know how much is required in the best of times to keep the museum building standing and stable. I know any heavy construction altering the foundations and walls of the current structure at 27 East 4th will without doubt result in losses to the merchant's house, possibly complete ones. You must know it too. And for what? For something not needed, not wanted, something not viable in our changing world, an empty hotel or empty office building, a dinosaur before it's even begun, but the merchant's house is needed and is wanted, more so with each passing year. Members of the Landmarks Preservation Committee, fulfill your charge. The future is watching you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Susan Matheson, followed by Michael Mari. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Susan Matheson. Can you, you can hear me, right? Yes. Well, you're all set. Please state your name for the record. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Susan Matheson, and I am the museum's grant writer as well as an art conservator, and I am testifying today to oppose the application. Um, first, as a conservator, I would like to address the safety of the collections, as um, Mr. Nicholson also attested to, uh, testified to previously. It is rare to find a historic house in such an original state with objects that are of family provenance. While in the museum's care, the collection has been treated, stored, and handled according to standard museum practice. As its grant writer, I have helped raise funds in, in support of both collection-wide preservation initiatives and the restoration of individual objects. Funders like the National Endowment for the Humanities have supported this work, a testament to the importance of the collections. Despite these efforts, the impact of time and family use does mean that collections are somewhat compromised. As an art conservator, if they remain on site during this construction, I can attest that the vibrations, dust, and other construction construction related detritus will cause irreparable damage to the original treadwell materials. Similarly, the extra handling required to move the materials off site will cause a completely different set of condition problems. For the safety of these important materials, please deny this application. As I stated, I'm also the museum's grant writer. In my case for support, I often state that New York has a wealth of historic sites that tell the stories of the upper classes, but you have very few that talk about the, the mercantile class. 
And Merchant's House is rare in that regard, and that makes it an integral contributor to our understanding of our historic past. Without that personal encounter with history it, in, in its original form, that the visitor currently receives the critical thinking skills, behavioral changes, and other educational opportunities the house avails will be lost forever. This will also occur if the construction forces closure for nearly two years or how many of many years. Uh, similarly, I would also like to stress the importance of the museum in the neighborhood. Much of the audience consists of tourists as we've seen previously with our, our friend from England. Um, and they all come to, to the museum for that step back in time that we've heard so much about. They also patronize area businesses who would lose the resulting revenue should the museum be closed and the tourists go elsewhere. Thus, a multi-year closure would have a much larger impact than just its effect on this important historic structure and collections. So please deny this application. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next is Michael Mari followed by Megan DeVito, then Pamela Wolf. Michael, Mari, you just need to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, you're all set. My name is Michael Mari. I have spent 45 years as a school teacher. And during those 45 years, commissioners, I have taught 5,000 students and taken hundreds of them on field trips. We have gone to nearly every museum in the city. We have gone abroad to Pompeii, to Rome, to Tuscany. And I don't think I can find the words to articulate how unique and how special the experience of my students has been in the Merchant's House Museum. It is a singular site. It is a miraculous survivor. I can only compare it to Pompeii. The reaction of my students was like the tourists who went into the homes of Pompeii. The other thing I wanted to bring to you commissioners was a question. What is the first guiding principle of any commissioner, anyone endowed with authority? I submit to you, it is very simple. First, do no harm. The proposed structure has a great possibility of doing harm. It, to me, it was very telling that the extremely well-prepared and erudite speakers for this building knew that the main objection was the damage it might do to the museum. But nothing in their speeches addressed that concern decisively. That silence, that failure, is telling. <clears throat> so I ask you then to look at the evidence, to look at the damage that could be done, to look at the value of this unique historical site and oppose any building which will destroy or threaten it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Megan DeVito, followed by Pamela Wolf, then Peter with Scala. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi, we can hear you. Please just state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hello, for the record, my name is Megan DeVito. Good evening, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition to the proposed new construction at 27 East 4th Street. Two directives from the New York City Landmarks Law that must be taken into account when LPC reviews proposals are to safeguard the city's historic, aesthetic, and cultural heritage, and to protect and enhance the city's attractions for tourists. Approving the developer's plans for 27 East 4th Street would neither safeguard nor protect the National Historic Landmark 
City Exterior Landmark, and City Interior Landmark Merchants House Museum at 29 East 4th Street. On the contrary, staff at the Merchants House Museum has repeatedly shown how construction of that magnitude adjacent to their building would cause irreparable damage to this landmark structure, including putting at risk the original 1832 plaster work in the parlors, considered by experts to be the finest surviving example of such work from that period. Therefore, I respectfully urge the commissioners to uphold their charge to safeguard and protect the Merchants House Museum, one of the first landmarks designated in the city, by rejecting the developer's proposal and encouraging productive dialogue between the developer, LPC, and the staff of the Merchants House Museum so that a solution can finally be found that ensures this treasured place will be enjoyed by New Yorkers and tourists alike for generations to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Pamela Wolf. Okay, and it will be followed by Peter Ritzgala. Pamela Wolf, I see you're in here twice. Bringing you in both times to see if that works. Okay, you just need to unmute yourself. There you go. Wow, it worked. This has been a saga. Thank you. My name is Pamela Wolf. Um, I've come today to speak on behalf of Save Chelsea. Save Chelsea agrees with CB2's unanimous resolution to deny the proposed building at 27 East 4th Street. While we usually advocate for landmarks in the Chelsea neighborhood, the adjacent Merchant's House Museum is of such citywide importance that we feel compelled to speak on its behalf today. We ask the commission to remember that Merchant's House is both, a unique, both uniquely intact and uniquely visited by the public. It calls for special attention. Any new construction next door at 27 East 4th Street should be limited to roughly the scale of the townhouse that formerly occupied the site. This will place the museum in a more historically authentic context of street scale, enhancing the experience of its many visitors. A larger building will not only dwarf the merchant's house and divorce it from its own period, it will impose unprecedented foundation loads that risk destabilizing the house. It will lengthen construction time and the museum's required closing period, incurring great financial hardship for it. We hope that the commission will bear in mind the question Paul Spencer Byard asked about mixing new and historic construction, quote, how does one building affect the meaning of another when their expressions are combined and interact, end quote. This is especially important for the Merchant's House given its prominence and importance as a tool for education. Clearly the more historically contemporaneous the scale of its new neighbor, the better. It's a textbook example of the reason non-contributing buildings like the existing garage are included in historic districts to preserve, not diminish, the value of their historic neighbors. Dave Chelsea testified last year against an oversized tower also designed by BKSK in the former backyards of historic row houses in the Gansevoort Market Historic District. We noted that it would deprive the row houses of the historic urban context that made sense of them and were impressed by the sensitivity to this concern voiced by the Landmarks Commissioners in their thoughtful discussion. Most called for a much smaller new building and one said, and, and one said that any new building was inappropriate. When an only modestly scaled back tower proposal was resubmitted, almost all of the commissioners noted that it would be better if it was smaller yet but they voted to approve it anyway. It will in fact be of unprecedented height for any new construction within the historic district. Somehow resignation that, de resig resignation that development must have its way prevailed. An appropriate building for 27 East 4th Street is one whose scale preserves the expression of the merchant's house, 
period, not a poor bargain between that and an oversized developer's proposal. We hope that the commission- You've passed your three minutes. Could you please wrap up? Right now. We hope that the commission will today show the understanding it, it expressed at Gansevoort Market and have the courage of its convictions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is uh, Peter Retzgala. And then we'll move to people that weren't on the sign-in sheet. So Peter? Yes, can you see me? Yeah, please just say you need okay. to record you three minutes. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. My name is Peter Rascala. I am a physician here in New York City. I'm going to keep it very brief. Uh, thank you all for being here, um, listening to all these comments. I think it's showing the, the power that the Merchant's House has on people. Um, I'm one of the newest people. I came to the Merchant's House in 2019 for a concert, and it's just really wonderful. I, I really recommend that you go check it out if you haven't already. Um, but I just want to say that it's such a beautiful place. And as a man of science, I can still appreciate the history that the house carries and what it holds and just the transformative nature of it. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I heard a quote that I think is really uh, apt right now. Um, when the last tree has fallen and the rivers are poisoned, you cannot eat money. I don't think this is a question about um, whether or not, you know, this building will be safe and stuff. It, it's about, you know, money. And I think we should uh, try to value other things aside from just pockets growing because at the end of the day, you cannot eat money. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, uh, somebody with the name Emin, Emin Sandhauser. Okay, who will be followed by Jason Zakai. So, Emin Sandhauser. So, Emin, there you go. That's me. Hi. Uh, thank you. My name is Emma Tannhauser, um, and I want to express that I uh, very strongly oppose this development. Um, I grew up uh, in New York City going to the Merchant's House with my family. Um, I did not end up working in art history or conservation or in museums. I just know how special the Merchant's House is, um, both to people who work in museums, people who enjoy museums, families, um, and just to New York in general. Um, I know I'm not the only one. Some of my fondest childhood memories took place at the Merchant's House. And as I grew up, I've visited again and again and loved it even more. When I've lived away from New York City and I feel homesick, uh, the Merchant's House is one of the things that I think about. I think about being there, celebrating New Year's with my mom and my sister. Um, even when we weren't getting along, we would go to one of our favorite museums and have fun and enjoy history and interiors and textiles together. And um, it was sort of the beginning of my interest in those things. Um, we, especially right now, need to be holding on to the things that make New York City a special place to live. Um, you can see an empty office building just about anywhere. Uh, there are very few places in the world like the Merchant's House, and it is absolutely imperative that we do everything that we can to preserve it. Um, it's, it's a treasure. Uh, also, as one final comment, I work as an occupancy planner, uh, planning the portfolios for various uh, commercial uh, tenants. And I can tell you that right now is not the time to be building more office space. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Jason Zakai, followed by DNA94. Okay, Jason Zakai, you just need to unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you choose. And there I am. Okay. Moment, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Jason Zakai. I'm an attorney from the law firm Hiller PC. We represent the Merchant's House Museum in opposition to the current application. As set forth in our written testimony, there are many reasons to deny this application. One important reason that I'd like to discuss today is the fact that the proposed work poses an existential threat to a precious individual landmark, which is also an interior landmark building. 
the landmark I'm speaking of, the Merchant House Museum, was constructed in 1832. It was one of the first landmark designations by this body in 1965. And its 19th century interior has been fully preserved all this time. As you know, the Merchant's House is directly adjacent to the project site at 27 East 4th Street, and simply put, would be a risk of being destroyed by the proposed construction next door. But don't just take my word for it. I urge each of you to carefully study the reports by structural and geotechnical engineers, concluding that the project is a serious risk to the building, and the applicant safety plans are simply far too inadequate to prevent significant damage to the building. And I believe one of the engineers will be speaking later today on this. Um, but just to add, the uh, engineers uh, for many years, including uh, th this year and this current application, have confirmed that during construction, the foundation settlement would result in compression <clears throat> in the amount of three quarters of an inch, which would drag Merton's house westward and downward, placing stretch stress on its interior walls and ceilings. This will cause a historic plaster in the building to crack and fall apart. Just as importantly, the engineers have explained that foundation settlement and soil compression could also compromise the st structural integrity of the fragile merchant's house, built on an 1832 rubble foundation, which lacks eff effective lateral support on either side of the building. If the merchant's house were to be pulled down, there is no guarantee the entire building would have just completely collapsed. While the applicant has a safety action plan for construction, the engineers have concluded this is simply insufficient to provide adequate protection. For example, the applicant's vibration limit for its drilling and other construction activities is much too high and fails to require the contractor to seize its activities until it's already reached the maximum limit. By then, it would be too late and the damage would be already done. Also inadequate is the applicant's sidewalk and roof protection measures. The applicant's plans also don't do not provide for adequate waterproofing details to prevent moisture infiltration, nor do the applicant's uh, plans provide for underpinning details, proactive stabilization measures, structural separation between buildings, or adequate detail regarding chimney flue extension. As the engineer's reports show, there is simply a significant risk of irreparable damage to the Merchant's House Museum. It must be pointed out that the fragile and nearly 200 year old, year old building has already been damaged by work at an adjacent building in the past. Such damage cannot happen again. The building will not be able to withstand it and the precious landmark will be lost forever. This commission must ensure that the landmark remain preserved and protected. For this and other reasons set forth in a written testimony, their current application that risks destroying a beloved landmark building is inappropriate and must be denied. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, DNA 94, followed by Merchant's House Museum. And I just would like to remind people to please limit your comments to three minutes maximum. DNA 94, you need to, um, there you go. Yes. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, and I just lost my testimony in the process of doing that. I can't replicate the, uh, the eloquence of, of everyone who's come before me, so I'll just uh, um, reiterate um, and say that uh, given the, the historical significance of this, this property, um, when you compare the social and cultural value of what is proposed, um, just one of many uh, high-rise hotels of which the city is full. Uh, in fact, I believe the property to its left, um, 25 East, uh, 4th Street or 25 East 5th Street is also a high-rise hotel, which, which diminishes the, the, uh, the, the claim significance that uh, the, the builders propose. And uh, given that they have, a, a, if it, as of at, at least as late as uh, September of 2019, they had a similar property uh, just blocks away from the Merchant's House Museum. Uh, if they still own that property, then that further diminishes their claim to the need to build where they want to. Um, and further, the offer of 403 uh, Lafayette uh, totally invalidates the need to put, needlessly put at risk, um, uh, New York City's first and uh, uh, one of its finest landmarks for such a small payback, potential payback. So I urge the, the Landmarks Preservation Committee to reject their proposal. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Merchant House Museum, followed by Richard Moses.
Yes, hello. Um, my name is Emily Hillwright, and I'm the Director of Operations at the Merchants House Museum. Um, I have worked at the museum since 2012. Uh, you've heard a lot today and in written testimony, I'm sure, about the architectural and cultural significance of the Merchants House, which is unparalleled, as well as the deep emotional connection New Yorkers and indeed visitors from all over the country and the world have to this special house. I have often said that the house has a way of making you fall in love with it. Many of our volunteers are individuals who simply came to visit the museum, fell in love, and have been coming back for a decade or more to give their time to a house that means so much to so many. Today, the developer is seeking a certificate of appropriateness for this new building. The proposed building is inappropriate for the NoHo Historic District for many reasons that you've heard here today. However, I think it's important to stress that even the most beautiful and otherwise appropriate new construction is utterly inappropriate and unacceptable if it results in the destruction of the merchant's house. And so I ask each of you to consider today your purpose as a commissioner on the Landmarks Preservation Commission. What use does the city have for a Landmarks Preservation Commission that does nothing to actually preserve the landmarks of our city? You cannot and must not pass the buck on this. You cannot and must not assume that it is another city agency's responsibility to protect the merchant's house. The risk is too great and there is too much at stake. You have a duty to the people of New York and in order to fulfill that duty, you must deny the developer's application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, Richard Moses, followed by Ted Andrews. Richard, do you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose? Yes, here we go. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Richard Moses, president of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. Uh, we submitted a written testimony, and uh, to avoid repetition and in the interest of time, uh, I'll just summarize by saying we're in agreement with the concerns that have been expressed so far, very much in agreement, and that any, uh, any new construction, regardless of the size of it, uh, certainly um, the size uh, that, that's being presented today seems very problematic, uh, but at any size, we feel that the applicants should uh, retain a team of experts that would include preservation engineers, conservators, and uh, other specialists who uh, could serve uh, the museum's interest and, and, and comment on any proposal uh, or, or any work that's gonna be done uh, going forward. So uh, I heard something about transfer of development rights um, raised and, 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 uh, and think that, that that would really uh, solve potentially a lot of problems. So anyways, uh, you know, we share everybody's concern about this uh, priceless uh, landmark building. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Ted Andrews. Followed by Justin Speedy. Ted Andrews, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, hey, try again to unmute yourself. Am I on? Just, yeah, please say your name for the record. You have three minutes. Okay, I'm Edward Andrews. I live on University Avenue in the Bronx. Uh, the I want to speak as from the perspective of a Bronx residents, resident. Uh, I, I agree with uh, the statements about uh, the experts concerning the engineering studies and uh, the potential problems for for serious damage to the Merchants House building if the hotel were to be built in the adjacent uh, lot. But uh, I think the, the fact that I have lived in the Bronx and found the Merchants House to be a very important destination and a part, in, in a part of my life for the last uh, 35 years while I lived in New York says something about the importance of the house to the New York City community. Uh, it's, its importance goes much wider than just Chelsea and Manhattan. Uh, 
So I oppose the construction of the 27 West 4th Street lot building. Uh, I urge the commissioners to think very carefully about the importance of the building to the average person in Manhattan. Uh, and I think that's what the landmark law, one of the tensions of the landmark law is to, uh, is to protect buildings that have importance to the population at large. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we have Justin Spivey. Um, he's gonna be followed by Kirsten Zitos. Justin, you need to unmute yourself, turn on your camera. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Justin Spivey. I'm a senior associate with Wiss Janney Elsner Associates in Philadelphia and um, consultant on behalf of the Merchants House Museum. And one of the services that we, we offer our clients is problem avoidance. And in reviewing proposals like this one, we anticipate problems and we encourage the working out of solutions on paper because once construction starts, there will be much greater pressure for it to continue regardless of the risks. The most critical risk for the proposed project is that excessive movement and vibration will damage the irreplaceable historic plaster finishes inside the merchant's house. Despite repeated requests, the developer's consultants have not provided us or the museum's geotechnical consultant, MRCE, with the details of their analysis predicting 3 16th inch of settlement. This seems extremely small and as a point of reference, settlement is often calculated to the nearest quarter inch. The soil will rebound during excavation and it will settle again under the weight of the proposed new building. The half to three quarter inch predicted by MRCE is the net total at the end of this process and up to four times greater than what the developers consultants have calculated. This significant discrepancy remains unresolved. We remain unconvinced it's possible to meet the quarter inch settlement limit in the DOB's technical policy and procedure notice 1088 for the proposed building based on what little we know about from limited exploration of subgrade conditions. We have asked what will happen if monitoring shows settlement approaching or exceeding this limit? Will construction of the new building stop at that height? Or will there be pressure to continue up to the approved height and attempt to repair any resulting damage later? We have identified unaddressed risks at each step in the proposed sequence of demolition, excavation and construction. The developers consultants have not addressed the risks that predicted settlement will increase due to vibration, due to deflection of excavation supports, which include vertically cantilevered soldier piles and timber lagging, or other construction schedule and phasing related risks. We're concerned about risk related to unresolved details at the corners of the excavation and proposed underpinning of the lot line wall adjacent to the merchant's house garden. Even if the proposed building can get out of the ground without damaging the merchant's house, there will be further risks of damage due to sidewalk and roof protection, including a proposed work platform cantilevered out over the merchant's house's slate roof, unresolved details for un waterproofing interfaces between new and existing buildings, omission of code required structural separation between new and existing structures, and unresolved details for chimney flue extensions, which are new in this proposal. For any of these unresolved details, it is possible there's no technically or economically feasible solution to reduce risk to an acceptable level. We will not know this until those details have been worked out in detail and given an independent review by qualified experts. Although it's not possible to completely eliminate risk, I cannot recommend that my client, the LPC or the people of New York City, accept the level of risk that is inherent in the significant unknowns of the current proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, Kirsten Zitos, followed by Lynn Funk. Hi, thanks, Lisa. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Kirsten. Okay, Kirsten, we can't hear you. 
Uh, this house museum is the only 19th century family home in New York City, pres preserved intact inside and out. The applicant seeks to build almost twice as tall as the Merchants House Museum and has not considered how the project will affect its foundation, which will cause catastrophic structural damage to this historic gem. Just because the application is as of right doesn't make it right. It's grossly out of scale and contextually incompatible um, with the surrounding buildings, the NoHo Historic District. <clears throat> And for the third time, Community Board 2 voted unanimously to reject this latest application. I ask that the LPC vote no and preserve this irreplaceable federal, state, and city landmark. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Lynn Funk. And Lynn, I'm going to bring you in to both of your sign ins. And maybe this time this will work. Hey, Lynn, on one of your devices, you need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Okay, Lynn, I'll try and prompt you by asking you to unmute. Yes, okay. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Lynn Funk from the Victorian Society of America Metro Chapter. It, it's our view that the first requirement for work undertaken on this lot, both de demolition and new construction, is that it be undertaken safely without damage to the old merchant's house. This may require a higher than typical level of review of demolition and construction plans and practices and monitoring to protect the house and its extraordinary interior. We suggest an independent assessment of the proposed construction and independent uh, construction monitoring to be incorporated into the project with the professionals in charge of these functions, not responsible solely to the developer of the site, but to the owners and occupants of the merchant's house or to an independent third party. And I know we did see monitoring protection program from the uh, applicant, but there must be more. Aside from these concerns about protection, Victorian society has no objection to the demolition of the garage, which we feel it doesn't contribute to the character of the historic district. It provides a poor context for the individually designated merchant's house. The proposed new building successfully takes its cues, design cues from historic loft buildings in the area around it. And it would be better if the floor, it was a floor lower and also without the setback roof level to give the house more breathing room and perhaps more sunlight in the garden. Some of us object to the faux open work cornice and would prefer to see a more traditional cornice type, which could be detailed to be harmonious with the character of the rest of the new building without mimicking the details of historic cornice. Finally, this project inevitably leads us to look at the other side of the merchant's house and the DEP's industrial open lot and chain link fence. What a horrible neighbor for the merchant's house, although I might have heard there's plans for that. Perhaps the commission could encourage its sister agency to provide an appropriate garden wall or ironwork fence and gate at this site. Thank you very much and good luck. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have Hal Hirshhorn followed by Joao Anderson. And I just would like to note that um, we only have people speaking once. So if you've already spoken, um, you could lower your hand. Okay, we just need you to unmute yourself. Okay, that, I think that didn't work. Um, let's move on to Joa Anderson. Okay, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, um, I was a volunteer. I'm Joa Anderson. 
I was a volunteer at the Merchant's House Museum many, many years ago. And one of the things that we worked on, and this is when Pi first started to build a volunteer group, was the clothing. And everybody that has spoken so far has talked about the fragility of the house and um, how the building next door, which I heartily disapprove of, um, will um, rattle the building. In addition to that, there will be so much dust and debris and the clothing, which again is one of the things that makes the Merchant's House Museum quite unique because it's not the dressy clothing that people wore for you know, society balls and things like that, but it's everyday clothing um, will become so um, just destroyed by the dust that filters into the house. One of the treasures of the Merchant's House Museum is the underwear. I mean, you know, you just don't see 19th century underwear anywhere. And the furnishings, you know, so over and above the fact that this building is completely out of context and not at all appropriate for that neighborhood. It should be opposed because of the destruction it will do to these very important artifacts that are just irreplaceable. Thank you so much. And I wish Pi the best of luck with this. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, Ted Andrews. Ted Andrews. Ted, I, you're muted. I think maybe. I believe Ted spoke earlier. Yeah, have you spoken already? Um, okay, I'm gonna move you back because we think that you've spoken already and maybe your hand raised was an accident. Okay, with that, um, that is everybody that signed up and had their hand raised. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And Rich, I'd like to just turn to you and see if you can summarize the written uh, documentation, written materials and testimony that we've received. Yes, sorry, just give me one second. I will pull that up. Um, so we have received a letter in opposition from Councilmember Rivera. We also received over 520 letters in opposition, including a letter campaign from JVSHP several organizations and many many neighbors and supporters of the merchant's house some of whom have spoken today uh, we also received a change.org petition with over 12,800 signatures in opposition and we also had the manhattan community board 2 resolution recommending denial of the application which is already noted okay great thank you very much okay and i also want to note for the record i neglected to do so at the beginning of this item that commissioners Chapin, Gustafson, and Goldblum are recused on this item and they have not been present at all for today's presentation. Um, I also want to thank the public for coming um, to our meeting today and participating. We had a lot of speakers and I think it's always very helpful and informative to have um, a, a lot of participation in our hearings. And I wanna, of course, thank the commissioners also for your careful, um, your attendance and, and sticking it out and listening to everyone so carefully. So thank you for that. Um, because of the late hour, what, and I think that there are still questions uh, about the engineering and structural questions. I think what we'll do is we'll take no action today and we will um, close the hearing and then adjourn at a future public meeting. Um, where the applicants can respond to the testimony and some of the questions that have been raised in today's testimony, as well as the materials that have been submitted to us. And then we'll have our discussion at that time. So um, with that, Commissioner Devonshire, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Sorry, you're muted. Sorry, Mr. Mute. I move that we close the hearing, the hearing, Sarah. Thank you. And Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you second that motion? I second that motion. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing is closed. We will um, resume the proceedings at uh, an upcoming public meeting when we have time to consider um, everything that we've heard and have some more information to some of the questions that have been raised today. So that's the conclusion of our day today, our, our full public hearing and public meeting agenda. Again, thank you all and we'll see you next week. Thank all you, the Sarah. best. Take care. Thank you. All right, so we are now going to end the YouTube link.